lista. So, Shalice, are we all set with uh, streaming now? Okay. Oh. Hey, Jim. Yeah. Before we get going, uh, Loretta, Jim, this is Tom. Hey, there. Nice Sam. to meet you, Tom. Abby's on this side here. Jim is our chairman. Hi, Abby. <laughs> nice to meet you both. I, I hope next month I'll meet you in person. Great. <laughs> and welcome. So for for uh, majority of the meeting, uh, I've talked to Rick uh, since he's in person and uh, uh, co-chair of the uh, board. Uh, I've asked him to to essentially facilitate and run the meeting. Um, I think it'll go a little better. Um, you know, with person uh, actually there. So, so with that said, uh, I guess for the pre-meeting, Rick, if you want to, you know, start from the top and. Okay. Well, I'll let you go with that one, Jim, and then. Okay. Yeah, I can. Uh, and we had talked about that. There's, we do have one tabled application uh, from 127 Court Street, which I'll. Uh, uh, try to start out with and, and, and move forward uh, as we get into the other new applications. So one quarter, 127 Court Street, uh, you know, we've seen this uh, several months now. Um, last, uh, last month, we uh, had uh, proposed uh, to the applicant and to the uh, planning department uh, that they look at for uh, into a number of different items in terms of past history and applications. Um, Shalice put together a, a, a pretty decent summary uh, back to the applicant of some of those things that the board had discussed. Uh, Shalice, maybe if you can uh, just uh, review that a little bit, your um, you know report back to the board and to the applicant of, of your findings. And again, it can be a brief summary so we can you know, touch on obviously the other applications. Sure, and I apologize uh, when I approach the mics. We still have construction work going on nearby, so it's uh, kind of loud on our end. I apologize. Um, the brief summary that we did, we looked into, I think we went back to 2014, uh, looking at any projects that had a historic site review and whether or not they had approved alternative materials going back to 2014. We were not able to find any evidence of that in the historic districts. Um, we did also look into the, um, the specific properties that were noted by Mr. Lattenville in his application. Um, of the ones, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. I have it at the computer, which I can't view at the same time. Um, but among those properties, there was essentially no historic site review application that was mentioned. Um, alternative materials for any of those properties. Either the properties did the work outside the scope of a building permit, or there was no building permit issue whatsoever. Um, so there was no building permit for historic site review approval granted for uh, final siding in place of wood siding. Okay, and then I and then I think we we still have the same application material as you know. Prior to our last meeting, we had a SHPO response. Um, uh, I believe it was the last SHPO response was from December 22nd, uh, which was generally a summary in support of their prior, you know, prior responses. Um, and then I don't, I don't believe there was any new application material at this point from the as submitted by the applicant. Am I correct, Shalise? Uh, there have been no, no new submissions from the applicant. Okay. Okay. So I guess at this point, I'll open it to, to the board, whether there's any questions, discussions. I guess the, the main new information is uh, from 
planning staff in the department on on their research of past applications. Uh, aside from that, we have uh, you know the same material that we've had for uh, several months now. So I'll open it to the board. Any questions, comments, discussion? I, I just want to take two seconds to uh, share my appreciation to Shalise. She did that upon request by the board and the applicant um, and took the initiative to, um, you know, put together that, uh, that summary of district uh, non-complying or non, um, whatever term you want to use, um, projects that included siding some specific properties. So thank you. And just to clarify on what um, what Shalise uh, uh, just told us, um, no properties were approved to use materials other than like for like. Is is that correct? That is the summary. I have pulled up the the full supplemental staff report um, for this project dated January thirty first. Um, at first, we have the comparison of the six properties that were noted by Mr. Lattenville as yep. properties in the district. Um, essentially, for each one, we have a summary finding of no approvals or vinyl signing sought or granted to the applicants or for his property owners for these properties. Uh, one of the properties was not located in the Fort Street Historic District. So, of the five properties that were, uh, there was no. Um, approval granted. Some of them did have building permits on file. However, the building permits also did not uh, sign or did not grant approval for final sign. Okay, good. Thank you. And, and again, thank you, Shalise. That was one more project that you didn't need to do. And I'd also like to say thank you again for um, setting up the um, training session that we had with Arch. That was incredibly informative and I think laid the groundwork for some really important discussions going forward uh, about the responsibilities and where the responsibilities will lie for um, the historic district and future historic buildings and districts uh, in our city. So thank you again for doing that. Therese, just a point of clarification. Sure. Um, does your report suggests that no final signing is applied to those properties? No. Um, what what it's finding is that no permit or approval was granted by the city for vinyl to be applied to those So the properties, properties. Is, at least some cases, do have vinyl siding, um, but in all cases, it, it was not approved. Some of them may or do have vinyl siding. I did do a field inspection, however, uh, we are not able to step onto the premises of the property. So I conducted two field inspections, uh, but had to stay within the right of way on the sidewalk over to the street. Okay. There were one or two that I questioned whether or not it was actually vinyl. Um, I believe that they may have been wood, but I could not, without getting further or close up, I could not tell for sure whether it was vinyl or wood. I do believe at least some of them were, were vinyl, uh, but there were a few that I thought may have been wood instead. Okay, thank you. Lise, were, you, were you able to identify a time frame when um, the siding was done on these properties? No, technically not. Um, what I was able to identify was when a permit was sought for some work. However, those permits did not grant final siding. So it's impossible to know at this point whether that final siding was applied during the process that they sought the permit for for other work or whether that was just some other work that took place at some other time. Yeah, because it is important to note that, and correct me if my time frame is a little bit off, but let's say 1985 when, that, when the documents within the registry were um, assembled to create our city district registry. The project could have taken place, especially in the case where some of these have 
uh, like aluminum type siding or metal siding or some other substance other than vinyl or a natural wood platform that was there. So it could have been done prior to, you know, the historic district even being registered. That's possible. Some of them uh, could be pre-existing to the current historic regulations that we have. Yes. Uh, a few of them, uh, and frankly, before I said, uh, appear to be vinyl. Actually, I believe that they may be aluminum, not vinyl. Um, so it's very possible that they may have been installed in the 70s prior to the existence of our historic uh, site. Okay. But present day records don't indicate that any training was ever applied for. For viral Okay. Um, and then we did view a few related applications going back to 2014. Uh, most of them did not request vinyl. They requested any kind of placements. There was one that did request vinyl. Uh, the work was conditionally approved and the work was never performed. Is that the one that came before this board? In 2019, yes. Okay. And that one was identified as a non contributing resource in the district. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, if that's all the question discussion uh, for that application, Shalisa, I'd also like to thank you for all your efforts. Um, towards this that you know your research and towards this application um you know you you definitely went above and beyond to 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 find all this information and uh you know provide the summary and thank you uh one one other thing to the to that i wanted to also share with the board i believe there was a question about um you know conditional approvals uh and what you know the what the board uh um the board's process can be for, towards application in terms of conditions. And I believe, uh, you know, Shalise may be able to help me with this, but we, we did reach out to uh, the city attorney who did indicate that, you know, applications can be conditioned uh, uh, to, to as, you know, what the board sees uh, appropriate in, in terms of the, you know, the zoning ordinance. Thanks, Jim. I'm going to go ahead and share that email now. Okay. Okay. So a couple of questions were raised. This was more a result, I think, of a conversation Jim and I had after the planning board meeting last month. Um, and we we had posed these questions to our corporation council and received the following responses. Essentially, yes, the planning board conditions uh, do not require the owner's consent. However, they must be rationally related to the code, health, safety, welfare. Or so then supported by the record. So if you're going to make a condition on approval for a project, it must be related to some aspect of code, uh, our zoning code, uh, building code, etc. It must be related uh, to that. It cannot be kind of superficial uh, condition. There was some ability to, there was some wiggle room within our specific historic site code criteria where there is some legal ambiguity between shall versus uh, should. And our code does not say shall. Um, so there is some flexibility. However, our corporation council um, urged us to have very little flexibility. I'm, I'm sorry, very little flexibility. Uh, but we sure have a better have a good explanation and rationale for why we are waiting for that uh, because it does have the tendency to set a precedent. Uh, cost is not in the code and it's not a, a standard for consideration in our standards for review of historic sites. Um, however, he did note that he believed this was used as a precedent for some other applications. The one he is referring to is making application of front bridge or hop street from two years ago and again that way it was considered a non-contributing resource but it had a different set of criteria on the review there was also a question of whether or not the application the applicant could seek a variance if they did not seek the approval desired by the planning board 
ultimately being said no, uh, a variance is not the appropriate method for appealing a planning board decision that would have to be in Article 78. Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals is authorized to vary the decisions of the voting structure. That kind of summarizes the questions that were asked. Did we get a copy of that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you again, Shalise. Um, if there's uh, no further comment on this, uh, we do have a other, other, uh, few other applications uh, on the agenda. Um, and Rick, if you want to uh, move forward with those. Um, I'm sorry, Jim. I had that. No. Oh, okay. I was going to say I can't hear you guys. So, Rick, you were you were saying something. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good time to segue in our conversation that we had with Dean regarding um, some condition over at the Bylas home, and maybe Shalice, after we're done the agenda, can um, update us on on that conversation, but. Um, there's some modifications to the courtyard area. Uh, basically, the site plan identified the courtyard with some, and it was in written format, not in steps. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are eight minutes away from the live meeting. Okay. I would suggest that we do discuss this, but maybe put it to other business centers at the end of their school. Okay. Is that okay? Well, the only reason I thought it was permanent is as we move forward with tonight's agenda, that any condition we we put on an application, um, especially with a second historic uh, property, that we elaborate on the condition and we make it part of the motion because without it, we have very little authority to enforce it. If it's only identified on the sketch plan um, as an illustration. So yeah, okay, if, if we're going to conditionally approve, and Jim, you can add to this, please. If we're going to conditionally approve, then all conditions should be noted in our motion and approved verbatim. Um, so that so that our intent is clear in the motion. I would agree, I would agree, Rick. So any, uh, I mean, with any application, uh, we've discussed in the past about you know making sure that the application is very clear within their plan, and if we have any conditions as a board that our conditions are outlined very clearly within the motion and resolution uh, that we're going to vote on. So that's that's I, I believe that's pretty much the the summary of what Rick's discussing. Okay, so you want to move on? Um, application 22-02. Shalice, you want to run through that real quick? Sure. 115 Court. Sure, this one is a proposal for a restoration of a property located in the historic, um, sorry, Court Street Historic District. It's actually one block over from the Latin Hill property that we also are reviewing tonight. Um, this one, the Sanctuaries have purchased the home. They are looking to make this a, I believe, a secondary home uh, to, for themselves. Um, it will be a single family residence, and they are proposing mostly in kind replacements of wood uh, that repairs to columns um, and some boards along the porches, et cetera, and some trim areas of trim. Um, they have noted in their application the materials that they tend to use, mostly pine and uh, some other forms of wood. They do have one alternative material they are proposing that is a synthetic slate. And I'm sorry, I left the sample up on my desk, but uh, for anybody who has a chance to come in and look at it before tonight's meeting, uh, we do have the slate sample upstairs. Um, it is a synthetic slate. And I Kate Cass, Barbara, I'm back upstairs. But uh, maybe one of us can go and grab that for you. It's, uh, 
it's made of um, kind of an acrylic type of material. It has it very, very, very authentic to the people the appearance. Like, um, they have quite the same weight of slate that you would feel if you're holding a piece of slate, but otherwise it has the same look and texture um, of slate. That was the only alternative material they were proposing. Um, it was sent to Chippo with a receiving response a little over a week ago. Um, and Chippo generally gave an approval of the product. Yeah. So sure. If I could just add, Shalise, um, the Trinity Church next door to City Hall, th that roof has a synthetic slate uh, roof. It was approved by the City Planning Board, I want to say 20 years ago. That could be plus or minus 10 years. <laughs> um, but anyway, if you want to see an illustration, Trinity Church is a, is a perfect illustration for that project. And we do have a, um, a, a historic decision that was made regarding that type of roof um, on a historic property. Any other questions? Okay, let's move on to 22 03 Latour subdivision. Uh, the Latour subdivision, uh, that one is approved by the Planning Board. Um, it's located on the corner of Hartwell and Waterhouse Streets in Ward 2. Uh, this one is what we generally call in planning a lot line adjustment. Uh, our code does not have a definition of a lot line adjustment, we only have a minor subdivision. So we, this is considered a minor subdivision for the purposes of our zoning code. However, for the purposes of um, the state environmental quality review act, we would consider this a not minor adjustment. Uh, it would be considered a type two action. Um, but essentially, the two neighboring properties are owned by the same owners, and they are conveying a small portion of the parcel of one parcel to the other parcel uh, to get the second small parcel in, and that is. Just the change being made there. Okay, I'd like to just add one short comment. This is a prime example of conditional approval. When we approve this subdivision, if we don't express the the concern about the conveyance or the condition of conveyance to the neighboring property, we've essentially created a twenty-five foot wide lot that unless it's fulfilled, doesn't have to be nexus to the adjacent property. So the condition would be that it has to be. So a first case in point of explaining the condition of an approval and stipulation. So in the staff report that unfortunately I was not able to get out to you guys until today, so if you have any trouble, have the opportunity to review that yet and pull it up. Um, but in the staff report, we do recommend the condition of approval be that they require a merger and that the merger must be folded on the class um, for a Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to 22 04 Frontier Property Management. This one's a similar kind of subdivision. Um, this one's a little bit more complex, so we're not considering it a lot wide adjustment. Um, this one is another parcel. This one's downtown. It's the old Merchant National Bank, uh, which was at one point the Cultural Center for the Art, the Crossroads Grand, uh, Richard Hall, and the Corner of Marion. Uh, the parcel does have frontage along Protection Avenue as well. Um, this one, they are proposing to subdivide the property, so roughly right behind the property where the Dean Arthur mural is. Um, roughly around there, they want to flip top it in half, and then the parking lot portion will be retained uh, and merged with two neighboring parcels also owned by the same owner. Um, and I believe, I believe the intention is to market the main portion of the property for sale, but I'm not positive. Um, they are not proposing to make a buildable lot there. It is something that they want to retain as a parking lot with several easements and agreements with certain property owners in the area for parking access for uh, neighboring business properties. Um, 
This is another one Rick, that would require a condition of approval that it be merged with the neighboring properties, the neighboring uh, parking lot properties. Um, and that's roughly to avoid certain variances that would be needed as well for, for many small area controls. But again, in the staff report, which I can pull up for you guys to get to it, um, we do have a condition there as well. So tonight, those two subdivisions, the lift store subdivision and the frontier property management subdivision, they are here tonight for classification as a minor subdivision and for approval of the tax plan. So not a final approval tonight. Okay. Just for clarification purposes, the subdivision um, may not be uh, at this time uh, intended to create a buildable lot, but do the dimensions comply with the minimum dimensions for a buildable lot, given the district it's in with zero lot lines and the fact that we are in a downtown parking district that all on all offsite parking can be uh, consumed by the by the city parking lots. So it is, yeah. So it's it's an interesting and intriguing one because yes, it's in the special assessment district. It is located downtown. Uh, I don't think there's a current parking demand being created by the proposed action. Um, if there as at some point in the future is a proposed action to build something there. Upon the condition of a merger, yes, the property would meet all, all buildable lot uh, requirements. Okay. And at that point, a site plan would, would enact any control necessary to come back to the board and review what it might impact on. So it may not be the intent today, but it does create the possibility that a buildable lot could be created. Yes. They, with respect to parking, there's also a Another factor, and I believe it's in the uh, special use permit process, that if a, if the same owner owns two adjacent properties with a special use permit uh, and put it in your deed, you can actually provide the required parking on an adjacent lot. But this isn't the case that we're citing because it's in a parking district that we provide public parking for a fee for all those properties that lack offset parking. Yes. Okay. Just to make the record clear. Um, so the other business status update by staff, um, the follow up to the um, historic site and the board bylaws. Are you about ready? Did we go through that quick enough? Um, I, we can, I would still suggest we move that to the end of the live meeting, but I can quickly go over them right now. Status updates by staff, we still are currently without a city planner, um, so I apologize again for a problem I have been getting a lot of details for you guys this month. Um, the ARCH follow-up, uh, we had a meeting approximately two weeks ago um, with Adirondack Architectural Heritage. Um, I will let you guys engage in the discussion about what you guys feel that you value from that conversation. Um, and there was a door left open at the end of that conversation for us to have future meetings, future trainings, and opportunities to meet with um, our in the future for anything that we feel that we might want from them that we feel valuable um, in terms of historic site training or how to work with our historic districts or how to adopt new historic districts and what we can essentially do. Um, so they are a great resource and they are open to meeting with you guys more. Bylaws, we do have the, uh, we had a bylaw meeting at some point in January. Uh, we can finalize the draft bylaws that we have to propose to the council for review. Uh, Corporation Council has confirmed that in New York State, bylaws for the city board are adopted by a local law established by the common council. So that's not for you guys to adopt, it's for the council to adopt. So we are looking tonight to. Uh, Dean has made the edits pursuant to the, com the comments made at the last meeting, and we're just getting kind of a sign off from you guys tonight that you guys are all set. You don't have to ask any questions, and then it's going to move to Dean to make any kind of necessary uh, preparations for that to mark the council for you and for the other people. So we're just looking to finalize that tonight. And by the time, 
Um, there have been some minor updates to the biosmol project. Um, there was some confusion and it, it, it led to a great discussion about how to handle certain approvals going forward and what requires and what triggers the project to come back to the planning board for review. Um, essentially, there have been some updates to, for those of you who worked on this project, uh, there's a memory care garden, kind of a courtyard area. It's bounded on three sides by the building and then on one side by a gated fence. Um, it's meant for the patients who have more memory care issues and they have more security risk issues with the virus home. Uh, there have been some updates to that area. The original plan that was approved by the planning board did have a note on there that there would be a proposed memory care garden, and there was a specific note called out on the bottom of the plan of what that garden might include. Um, it referenced pergolas, papers. Um, you know, we're, we're also, we're yeah, and it's going to include that one, which wasn't attached to the note, but it's essentially um, a hard surface walking area um, in, the, in addition to some seating areas that are finished. Um, what really threw me off is I thought that it would be a smaller portion of, of the court area it's almost the entire court area. Not a bad thing, but I felt we had a lot of discussion about it uh, and that it should be brought back, even if it's for explanation uh, as to where we, uh, where we approved it and where it's going in the future. So um, is, have they consented to coming back? They have. Um, okay. Well, we can go into more detail in the live meeting. I can right. see that towards the end, but we can go into more detail and discussion about that then. But yes, they essentially they plan to come back next month for an advisory type of presentation to the board. Um, for uh, the Corporation Council has reviewed it. They don't believe that it rises to the level that it requires the product be reopened for review by the planning board, but they are going to come back and present the changes um, for any text comments that they might have, but they would not be binding in the form of a presentation or updating their paper. That achieved the objective that, you know, I made a decision that I thought they should come back and it's primarily for informational purposes so that um, you, you can see the full development of the core area. The other thing that I think is is very important, like Shalee said, it it inspired a whole other level of conversation on the conditional approval. So um, I think great value came out of that, that meeting. So are you ready to? So 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 real quick, Rick, before we move into the regular session, I'll, I'll uh, remind the board that as far as the Vilas Home application and discussion goes, I re am uh, recused from that application. Uh, my, my firm is working on the engineering site plan for that. Uh, so that would also open up the board to one of our two new alternates being an active member. Um, you know, on a past application, I believe we have process for familiarizing with a past application and decisions made um, in order to step in in the middle of an application. So, um, you know, that's just a, something for the board to keep in mind. Thanks, Jim. That, that reminds me, I did forget my other piece of new business. Um, welcome to Abby and Tom, our two new planning board members. Thank you for joining us and for your willingness to serve and volunteer for our community. You're Working alongside a great group. Thank you. I meant it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, shall we say the pledge? Yes. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. The 
Rex, do you want me to do something? Um, Jim is, Jim is going to take the first application okay. um, remotely. So from there, then I'll take the, the next ones. Okay. So Shalice, why, why don't we start, a, uh, start with a roll call of the active members of the board? Uh, Jim Abdullah. Yes. Rick Perry. Yes. Red Carter. Here. Kurt Burmich. Yes. Yes. Adam Muser. Oh, sorry. Adam Muser. Muser. Yeah, Muser. Yes. Tom Costa. Present. Thank you. And then Shalise, uh, I guess we'll uh, uh, move right to uh, the first application, uh, which is 2021 13 127 Court Street Historic Site Review. So this is a historic site review project that was originally applied for in May of last year. Um, first reviewed by the planning board in June of 2021. Um, this is their fourth time which is before the board. Is, is Mr. Latinville present? He is present. Okay. Uh, this is their fourth time before the board. Uh, we closed the public hearing, I believe, in December. Uh, the December 28th meeting today is the 62 day deadline, so a decision is required to be made tonight. Otherwise, it reverts to an automatic, um, automatic approval of the project for the applicant. Uh, so, uh, first uh, so, this is just some pictures showing that the property is located on the corner of Court Street and Well Street in the Court Street Historic District. It is zoned RH. And the yellow indicates the price of this corner property right here. Uh, it's showing that it's located within the historic district. Um, so, their June submission, Mr. Lattenville submitted a request to replace the existing wood clapboard siding with vinyl siding on the entirety of the house. These are some images of the house as it is today, or approximately today. Uh, this is not, uh, this is a picture provided by the applicant showing one of the affected areas, showing that the siding has suffered some water damage in certain areas and is deteriorating. Um, particularly notable areas are this area here below the uh, window air conditioner unit. And I don't know if we're having the picture in this slideshow, but up at the top here, what's kind of not on the screen, is that there is a um, interesting meeting of turrets and angles of the roof right here that kind of leads to water runoff coming right down here in great force as well. Uh, the applicant had provided in his initial application um, a history of the time that he has painted the existing wood siding. Um, and he feels that the wood siding used a lot more paint due to the number of times that he's painted it. And so that it's no longer cost effective to retain the wood that's there today. Um, he had provided some quotes of uh, the siding. This is the material for the siding. This was the labor for the installation of the siding. Uh, this is the, the siding that he proposed to use. It was this K can brand. Um, I believe he was looking to use this T3D, this plastic one, the one that's got the three panels. Um, he also provided quotes for painting the, the uh, house, which would be, I'm sorry, this painting or this replacement. Sorry, this was repla replacement the other painting of the, the wood side. Um, including labor costs, this one also includes rental equipment for reaching the top of the house. Um, the project was was referred to Shippo in June of 2021. Uh, their initial response was that the building is listed in the state register um, and is a contributing resource to the Court Street Historic District. Based on their, their review, the office recommends again, against the installation of vinyl siding um, in accordance with the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic buildings. Vinyl siding would not be an appropriate treatment for the building. Um, they did note that Siding, the extra bulk of putting vinyl siding over wood siding 
would alter the relationship between the back of the siding and the trim, causing the siding to sit flush with or proud of the trim, and that would help alter the sort of appearance. Um, also, the siding installed additional moisture from settle behind the vinyl, resulting in deterioration of the underlying historic siding and potentially causing structural damage. And that more important measures would be to direct moisture away from the walls with proper flashing covers. Um, there was also a note from the applicant that there was a heating concern or an insulation concerns. So they also addressed insulation in their response to that. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the letter that was received, received from Chippo. The board reviewed all of this information, and at the June meeting, they decided that they wanted to see what it would look like if the applicant had. Installed vinyl in a certain area, how it would stick against the trim. Um, so there was a small portion that they that the Latville cited um, and showed in images that will be shown here soon of how that would look. Um, I think they also requested that he note in architectural drawings what information would be, or I'm sorry, what architectural details would remain, for example, the dentals. Um, and then also requested the board make the shit all the way through again. Mr. Lattenville responded to this request with this, this uh, image highlighting the architectural details that he would preserve. This includes most of the trim and the tools of the fascia, other portions of the, the house and columns as well on the porch. Okay, showing the details to be preserved. This is the image showing how the vinyl would sit against the trim of the windows. Uh, the information, the updated information was sent to Chippo again um, in August of 2021, and they responded again that the covering the entire building with vinyl siding. I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Latinville also noted that gutters were not possible to be installed along that section of the, the roof where the uh, meeting point of the turret and other uh, portions of the roof were uh, due to the specific angles, gutters would not be able to be installed there to prevent water runoff. Chippo um, responded that covering the entire building with vinyl siding does not meet preservation standards. Uh, they recommended fiber cement siding as an alternative siding material that is generally more acceptable. Um, and in this case, they determined that alternative siding might be. Um, acceptable specific areas of the building where the water damage issue is occurring. Um, and they noted that any substitute siding materials should have a smooth, non grain, I'm sorry, not non grain appearance. Fiber cement typically has a smooth side and a dark side. Uh, this was an image of the letter. After reviewing the updated information, the board requested from the applicant to clarify the depth of the the J channel would be used for the siding. They also wanted a clarification of whether it would be three inch siding versus, correct me guys, if it's two or four inch, if I don't recall the moment. Uh, I think it's four inch siding was the other alternative that was being looked at at the moment or at the time. Uh, they wanted a uh, clear illustration depicting what the proposed treatments would look like and how that would address specific angles of balls where they met at non 90 degree angles. Um, they wanted a detailed comparison of the use of white wood siding versus vinyl siding and also a comparison of fiber to cement siding as a whole. Uh, the applicant proposed this letter um, in December. Essentially, they proposed that they provided a quote for the fiber cement materials. They provided uh, an image, uh, sorry, narrative of how the new can only decide. How the, I'm not an architect. <laughs> I'm sorry. How the vinyl would meet at the angles of the, the walls. Uh, they provided that information and then they also described which section would not be altered. Uh, the, the dentals, cornices, and needles, towers, etc. Uh, they showed the, provided these images showing how those non 90 degree angles would appear. They provided the fiber cement quotes. Uh, the applicant also noted some hazardous material condition, uh, concerns that he was concerned about uh, in the fiber cement material 
uh, for shores. However, these can be mitigated as noted in the brochure. Um, the risk is only during the installation of the project, not the use of the project, uh, I'm sorry, the product, and by uh, using proper safe handling and sort of procedures, this can be mitigated. Uh, this is the building structure inventory form as completed in 1981 when the building was first nominated for the National Register. Uh, specific notable features of the, build, of the building included house, uh, cost cable proof, pedimentary as pedimentary projection, there's recessed porch, I'm not saying not that super tight, entry on the third story, octagonal tower with a tech roof, bracketed cornice. Leaded multi panes and one over one windows, classical porches for columns, double glazed and panels. The information provided by the applicant was sent to SHIPO again in December uh, while received. Uh, SHIPO responded again stating that these black siding is generally not appropriate replacement siding material or historic wood siding. Alternative siding material may be acceptable for the areas of the building where the issue, the water damage issue, is occurring. And any substitute siding material should have a smooth, not non filtering appearance. And that any decorative siding, historic window, door trim, and other sort of decorative and elements should be replaced. Letter and these are the historic site review standards as listed in the C code. I apologize for those who are new. I'm flying through this. Um, I think the board is the other board members are a bit more familiar with this. Uh, specifically, we have highlighted specific uh, sections of the code that are that are relevant in the review of this project. Uh, there was during the public hearing, there was one public comment. Uh, this this uh, resident did not approve the project and they noted that it was a significant complication of the streetscape um, and that they have turned this was a former Betty board member who noted that they had turned down other applications in the past for that is all I've got in the presentation for this. Um, however, I also have a report that was requested at the January meeting. Um, Shalice, uh, just so you know, the, oh, there you go. Okay, now we're seeing it. I wasn't seeing the documents. I've got them um, on my phone so I could follow along, but now now we're seeing what you're referring to. Thanks. Sorry, Laurie, that took me a minute to pull that one up. Yep, no problem. Thanks. Okay. And as discussed in the meeting, uh, the work session before this meeting, uh, the board at the January meeting requested a, a comparison and evaluation of the, I, the properties identified by the applicant in his application that had received final siting approval uh, nearby his property. He identified six properties of them, only five are located in the historic district. Um, and in a review of the record between the planning board and the building inspection offices, there is no approval or permit granted for final siting for any of these properties. Uh, upon a field inspection, some of those properties may not have vinyl, um, but it's hard and difficult to, to determine from the public right of way that you not um, step onto these properties. So in a field inspection, um, there are, were one or two properties that may have had wood and a few that may have had aluminum. Um, there was also a historical review of past applications of vinyl or siding replacement on historic properties going back to 2014, um, which were the most successful records we had. And there was no request for vinyl for two out of three, the three projects. One project did request vinyl, it was conditionally approved, maybe meeting some criteria. This was on a non contributing resource in the Green Park Court Street District, and the work was never performed. 
We did also look through all other historic site review applications that we could find on file, and most of the other uh, historic site reviews were limited to in kind replacements for other types of historic changes as well, including windows, roofs, portions, fences, etc. That is all we have. We have not received any new information from the applicant. Uh, Mr. Lattenville is present. Um, again, the public hearing on this item is closed. Thank you, Shalise, for the uh, thorough summary, uh, at least as, uh, as long as you could. Uh, put into it, uh, you know, re, re reviewing the uh, material that uh, surely has been reviewed over the last several months. Um, with that said, I, I guess to open it up to, to see if the, uh, does the applicant have any further comments uh, or um, information for the board? Mr. Latinville, you're speaking. We cannot hear you. He is present, uh, but not responding this time. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess uh, with, with that summary, uh, we did have a review in the pre meeting. Uh, does the board have any uh, further comments, questions, discussion um, in <laughs> regards to the material? material that's been reviewed over the last several months and then any of the new material um, you know presented from staff tonight I'd, I'll make one comment um, you know we we each look at what our responsibilities are mainly I think from our professional backgrounds it's personally worth Personally, I came, came here from um, zoning and building code enforcement where I see the project is from the position where I came from, where we followed laws, rules, and regulations. We didn't, we didn't enforce suggestions, recommendations, um, like is bestowed on us within our city zoning ordinance and the national, the Department of the Interior directives. They are recommendations, they are suggestions, they are not laws, rules, and regulations. Okay. So, and I thought hard about that after I listened to Loretta speak at the last meeting where. You know, she, she asked about our discretion. Where is our discretionary authority? Um, where is our individuality when we look at these, these different subject matters? And all I can say is from my position and my background, where I enforce laws, rules, and regulations to insist that somebody follow a, a standard that's either a suggestion or a recommendation. So I have a, I have a bit of a difficult time trying to impose something that's not written as a law, rule, or regulation. So from there, you know, the difficulty that I'm having with uh, assessment isn't difficult from my historic background. And that's, that's where this brings about a great deal of confusion to me. Because um, I, I don't see how we can impose or insist on suggestions or recommendations that are not formatted in a law, rule, or regulation. So that's, you know my, my feelings, 
that's the position I've taken. Um, and I, I know the arguments, I've listened to them, I respect them and I appreciate them. But I, I can't, I can't go beyond what I think our ability is um, as a as a planning board. That's it. Um, I'd like to jump in and um, well, my background's the Coast Guard, so uh, I did law enforcement, but yeah, I don't think this falls under the same category. Um, you know. Um, I love preserving, and uh, I'm not going to reiter reiterate everything I've said in the past. Um, I love preserving to the best of our ability, the history that we have in this city. And that said, um, the reality is that uh, in our downtown, the majority of the buildings that we have were built, you know, probably a hundred, 150 years ago. And the majority of them, especially as you get closer to downtown, are in disrepair and have had really ghastly over the years. And, um, you know, and that's uh, that's the reality of, you know, a city that, you know, we're not undergoing an economic boom right now. Uh, hopefully we will at some point, but uh, in the meantime, you know, we're trying to preserve the beauty that we have and encourage people who live in homes that have been um, where the character has been seriously compromised. And, you know, all I have to do is go outside and walk up Lorraine Street to see that. Um, that's just our reality. And I don't want to perpetuate compromising the integrity of the homes. However, for homes that really are magnificent, and the home that we're talking about right now is a is a magnificent home. I believe it's very important to um, encourage the owner to maintain it. And as a homeowner myself, who had to make the same decision, so I, you know, I have no choice but to bring. The, this is my experience. Um, I could not afford to do wood for wood on my house. And so I did go with vinyl siding. And, you know, I, lo I know lots of other people who have done the same. I also know people who have gone with the cement product that's available. And um, that's also a fabulous, you know, uh, material. The fact that, you know, Shalee shared that some of the homes that she looked at that are classified in the historic district, she couldn't tell from the sidewalk whether or not they had siding on them or not, or whether or not it was the original wood, you know, just reminds me that what are we trying to preserve here? Are we trying to preserve the structural integrity of the house and make sure that it's around for the next generation? Or are we trying to create a museum? And there are people who want to do that, you know, with their homes and, oh my God, I applaud that. But the reality is that in Plattsburgh, New York, that's not a financially reasonable burden for people to take on in their homes. And so as, as Rick just said, you know, that's why it's a discretionary, um, it's discretionary what SHIPA advises us. And, you know, as um, I think Matt said it in, in what he said, there's a big, a big difference between should and shall. And for me personally, if I'm looking at a house that's already rotting, um, just being allowed to you know, go to seed, that would be a tragedy because no one's gonna rebuild that home. You know, It would have to be torn down and would get nothing like it um, as a replacement. And so you know, the quality of vinyl siding, it, as horrible as it sounds, it's not that horrible. It, the, the reality is it just doesn't look awful anymore. It used to, and aluminum siding, I mean, yeah, that's pretty rough. But again, if, you know, one of the conditions is that the applicant use smooth vinyl siding. Um, at the end of the day, my only concern is, is whether or not it's going to compromise the moldings around the windows that 
that is a legitimate concern on our part. I still don't quite understand how putting the siding on top is not going to bring out the, the depth enough that it, it just runs flush to the frames, to the moldings. But, um, you know, we've been assured that it won't. And, um, but I think that encouraging people to invest in their homes is very important. And um, so that's, that's all I have to say on it. See that Mr. Latville is joining us. Is this working now? Yes. Hey. Oh, hi. <laughs> Jim, I don't. Is it working still? It's it's working. I we have hear you. We no hear you. idea how you do this. Uh, you just when you initially started, you told me to push this button. How do you know that? I had no idea. Can you see me as well? We do. Oh, good. I'm glad I did my hair. Uh, <laughs> I did present, I did send an email today to Shalice regarding, uh, I don't know, Shalice, did you read that in the record? Uh, no, I did not see an email from you. What time did you send that? And 41 this morning. Should I read it, put it in the record? Yeah, you can read that and maybe also forward that again. Yes, certainly. And Shalice, I can barely understand you through all of this. I think you're far away from the microphone. I, I am, I'm sorry, the computer is not in the microphones. Okay, it's very difficult to hear you. I, I caught some of it when you said Latinville, I, I got that part. But sorry, the, yeah, if you could resend that again, I do oh. not see it in my email. Did you Did you by any chance send it to the Gmail that I was using when we had the, the email outage a couple weeks ago? No, I added it to the one that you sent me January 26th as a reply. Check your reply on January 26th. You sh should see one uh, this morning, February, what's today? Oh, yesterday, 27th. I have no idea, what day is it today? So, but if you could go ahead and read that, I still don't have it. If you could forward that again and then just read that in right now, that would be great. Okay, it says, uh, well, good morning. Um, regarding those items stated below, and this was relative to the conversation that you sent me in the uh, with respect to uh, 129 Court Street and your research. Studying the results of these previous applications where some applicants applied and some applicants installed without approval. I cannot see any mandated requests for architectural engineered drawings within a permit, with any permit requiring blueprints or drawings. Further, there's no mention of corner edge meeting in any of the applications, which was required at the last planning board meeting. Standard installation of siding requires standard and familiar J channel. Um, that's what we plan on using. Previous photos I provided showed the, um, in, in subsequent meetings, uh, should show that, which you alluded to and referenced. Uh, we provided color copies and photos that include the specific areas only where we're going to be applying the siding, but no unusual dynamic or specific section, sections requiring anything but typical installation. Therefore, the siding will be trimmed with a tractive modified J channel according to my request as previous photos indicated and concurrent with the board's previous discussion, uh, performance of which is we're going to be applying white triple three siding, not double four, but triple three, which is identical to that presently on the building. We wish to preserve the building in its closest form to its original grandeur as Loretta just maintained and keep the structural integrity and historical identity. We understand planning board concerns since our initial meeting on June 28th, find the scrutiny of this project a bit troubling and render the possibility of uh, failure at that. While understanding Shippo's indication, and when I, I quoted from them, it is genuinely, it, excuse me, it is generally recommended, end quote, which board members in the previous two meetings indicated that Shippo is implying this decision is up to local agencies for interpretation. Now, it's an aside, not in the record. We did have that discussion a while ago. It is the local board's interpretation of where we live, not people on Wolf Road or Western Avenue in Albany. 
Local interpretation, back to the letter, local interpretation is a main concern of the planning board in which we need to apply reason and logic to the subject property. It's our wish that you consider this and allow us to correct it. Um, it's a pretty building. I want to keep it pretty and I want to keep it upright. As uh, the new members or the alternative members, alternative, alternative, what's the alternate? Alternate, thank you. I want a PHS. Um, I own, I don't know, Shalise, did you show the other buildings that we rehabbed as well? No, but I can pull up your original application. Please pull up, pull up the original application to show the new alternate members what our history is and what we do. Uh, we don't run, rape and pillage and burn after. We, uh, where my office used to be, um, it's presently where the DAR, Daughters of American Revolution used to be, on the corner of Cornelia and Broad. That was my former office. And, and uh, that building you see down below it took me 12 years to get the paint off it. Now it's really fairly hidden with those trees. 12 years to strip the paint, redo the brick, and redo the, the slate uh, up above that. The building to the right was built in 1820. It was the second building on that street built by James Bailey. I bought next to it. Also, Rick, you had discussed that the faux siding, the slate siding that is on the Trinity Church uh, is what I put on 7 Cumberland Avenue, which was, mm -hmm. was it Judge Booth's? It's the same, uh, the same full siding. And I did that and it looks beautiful at a, at a quite a cost, but it looks beautiful. I wanna do the same with this building. I bought it in 1985, I painted it over and over. It keeps rotting every five years in those same areas. Just wanna make the structure solid. So the next generations, as you said, can take a look at it and enjoy it. If you say no, I'll respect that. I wish you don't. I'm, I'm not unreasonable. I'm not an unreasonable guy. I've gone through these, I've gone through six months of this, Jim. Um, six months. I have, I think the longest we've been through this before was when we did Freedom Heights and did the subdivision over there. And that was 13 months. This is only a building, but it's a very important building. It's siding in the areas. And Shalice, did you show the areas that I had highlighted in pink? Yes. Okay, those areas are the only ones. The detail work with the dental work, lentils. I don't know, Jim, what do you call those things that go like this? The crown, not crown molding, but the, uh, they, they come out, I don't know. Brackets. The brackets. Brackets, yeah, they're beautiful. And they're set in with trim and, and uh, re it's beautiful. Ornate. I'm not, Touching the thing, nothing. All I want to do is the siding. So the building maintains it. We're going to, while we're putting on the siding, we're going to paint all of those ornaments as well. And that's pretty much me. That's all I have. So Jim, I did find your email. It was sent for that temporary email account that was used during our email outage earlier this month. Can't hear you. Oh. Sorry. Sorry, I did find your email. It was sent to the temporary Gmail account that was used earlier this month when we when I oh, had the outage. Um, I'm going to pull that up now for the board members to see. Okay. Okay. And we did what we had to back then just to keep running. Is the city falling apart? What's going on in the, in the back? Great question. Construction? The new windows, the new windows are getting put in. Finally, wonderful, absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Did they go through Shippo? Yes, they did. There was a national, it's national, isn't it? That was done by the guy who did the Lincoln Monument, wasn't it? The uh, city hall. Anyway, it has history. Julius, are you still looking to share? Yep, I'm sorry, I had to log into the Gmail off the oh, Okay.
So I believe Jim has generally read this in, you know, into the record and presented it. And then, uh, Shalise, you can formalize a hard copy into the, into the application record. Um, as far as the, uh, board goes, I believe two, two people have, uh, had questions or comments, discussion. Is there any other further discussion uh, from the board? Sure, I'll make a comment, Tim. Um, so this is this is Kurt. I know you can't see my mouth moving. Uh, oh, All yeah. right. <laughs> uh, Shalise, thank you so much for the historic site review of the neighbor Marion properties and up and down Fort Street. Jim, thanks for uh, hanging in there with us for six months. I absolutely agree that this scrutiny has been unusual and taken longer than it should. I think that in general, our planning board has a difficult time saying no or disapproving an application. And sometimes that's a good thing because we find a point of compromise and win-win situations. And sometimes um, it doesn't work out that way. In, in this case, we have a city ordinance that prioritizes in-kind replacement. We have public comment that suggests the replacement is not appropriate. We One, have guidance from the National Park Service that says it's not appropriate. Uh, just Our to interrupt for a moment, how many public comments did we receive? We have one public comment. So I'm in. In, this, in this case, our state historic preservation organization gives us two alternatives and suggests that the material in the application is not appropriate. In the past, as far as I can tell, we, I, I, I think that we've only approved in-kind replacement for structures that are contributing to the horror historic district like this one. And we've turned down requests for vinyl on contributing structures. Our city attorney suggests that we use our flexibility sparingly. And given, and given the nature of this request, it sets a precedent that, in my opinion, will lead to many more frequent requests for the same flexibility. Our interpretation in this case isn't a site-specific one. It is one that many homes in the historic district face, and an exception in this case cascades to many other homes, setting a precedent. It's a major new interpretation, not a sparing one, as the city attorney describes. And a major change like this shouldn't be done by an unelected board interpreting a code. It should be done through a democratic process, not at this board level. We've requested additional engineering and architecture plans. We haven't, we haven't seen them. I'd like to introduce a motion to disapprove planning board application 2021 13 at 127 uh, Court Street. I, I, I would suggest that if the applicant submits a new application for either the cement board or in kind wood, that the board would review that as a new application and not a revision to an existing one. That therefore we discussed, made, we discussed made that at the last meeting. Two years or whatever that process is. So, so Kurt, did you, did you, uh, I apologize. I, yeah. I heard a motion there. Or I mean, was that yeah. just discussion leading to a motion? No, I'm, make, I'm making a motion to disapprove planning board application 2021-13 at 127. Oh. Okay, when, so uh, before we enter into enter the, before I ask for a second to, to the motion, Shalise, can you clarify, we have held the public hearing. Yes, have uh, we, an environmental decision was made uh, at the December 28th meeting. Sorry. At the December 28th meeting, a decision was made uh, to declare a negative declaration for the environmental decision. And the public okay. hearing was closed at the December 28th, 2021 meeting. Um, today okay. is the 62 day deadline. Okay. So we have, we have clear, uh, we have, uh, we have determined the environmental determination as well as uh, opened and closed the public hearing in regards to this matter. Uh, so we do have uh, at this time a motion from Kurt to deny the application. Um, 
Can you can you uh, reread your motion again, please, Kurt? I make a motion to reject Planning Board Application 2021-13-127, Kurt Street. That's the motion. Okay. Uh, do I have a second? This is Reg. I'll second. Okay. Second by Reg. Uh, any further discussion or comment? If not, uh, Shalise, can I have a roll call? Rick Perry. Being the motion was made in the negative, can you tell us what the two responses should be yeah, or so, could be? So a motion in the affirmative, an I or a yes motion would be to to agree with the motion and to, to disapprove or reject the application. So an affirmative vote here rejects the application. Okay. Then I'll vote in the negative. No. Sorry. Rich Carter? Yes. Kurt Gervich? Yes. Loretta Rizuma? No. Jim Abdella? Yes. Motion carries. May I ask you to substantiate your votes? Findings. Findings. So, so the so the applicant is asking that we that each person substantiate their vote, um, or explain their explain uh, what their voting decision was, and then if they have any reasoning for it. Um, so, so kind of what you, uh, I think he's looking for a findings statement of some kind of as a practice and something that you should offer. Yep. Uh, so the commentary that you provided to the group. So I'm happy to do that. Um, I, and in, in doing that, I, I want to say that I, I appreciate the work that the applicant has done on other buildings. And I appreciate the time and consideration the applicant put in on this one. In this case, we have a city ordinance that prioritizes in-kind replacement in our historic district. We have public comment that we have, we have public comment uh, requesting in-kind replacement. We have guidance from the Department of Interior and National Park Service that guides us towards in-kind replacement. We have our state historic preservation organization giving us two alternatives and guiding us towards in-kind replacement. In the past, as far as I can tell, in the historic district, we've only approved in-kind replacement. In other cases, as far as I can tell, in the historic district, and that's for contributing structures, as far as I can tell in the historic district, we have turned down requests for vinyl siding at other contributing structures. The city attorney suggests that we use our flexibility, our ability to interpret the code sparingly. And our interpretation in this case would not result in a limited site specific interpretation. As Loretta described, many homes in the historic district are in similar condition. And an exception or flexibility or, or a new interpretation of the code in this case sets a precedent that will cascade to many other homes. It's a major shift, not a sparing one, as the city attorney describes. A major change like this shouldn't be done by an unelected board as ours is but by an elected one through a revision to the zoning code. For those reasons, I voted to disapprove this application. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Shalise, maybe if you can go down uh, 
in general order of the roll call. And once again, if a board member feels uh, appropriate to offer discussion, then please do so. Rick Perry. Uh, I gave my justification at the last meeting, but I'll, uh, I'll reiterate again. I can't find, I'm looking at the historic site um, code right now, and I can't see where it identifies in-kind replacement, okay? The, the other thing is when you reference the Department of the Interior's guidance, they recommend, they don't mandate, they don't regulate, they make recommendations. I think when you start taking the discretion of individuals that were chosen by the elected officials to assume the seat, they, they choose us on various basis. The basis that we, we all have the ability to make rational, informed, and compliant decisions. How we interpret those those, the regulations that guide us is up to us as individuals. I've said from the start and I'll, and I'll say it again. I don't look at a recommendation as us being required to follow that guideline. I think that we've been entitled to applying our own interpretations to the guidance that's given to us by the local ordinance, by the national, but they're not mandates. They're, they're guidelines. There are circumstances. And Mr. Landa, I went on site. I looked at this. I gave them recommendations on roofing that I reported back here. I gave recommendations on gutters, each of which he went to professionals. He had professionals review and try to come up with alternatives to control the negative situations that this building has had bestowed on. They couldn't come up with anything other than an alternative to protect the site. Looking at that siding, some of it's bare wood. I'll assure you one thing, it's not 120 years old. When, when our staff went around and looked at various properties, we cited two reasons why um, not all properties received permission from the planning board or through building permit. But the third one wasn't recited. And I'm going to recite what that third one is. The third reason is that the siding was changed prior to the, the enactment and the creation of the historic district in the registry of historic sites. Right? So it's not like people broke the law, which seems to be the first assumption, the first assumption that's made. Okay? To me, that should be the last for the benefit of the doubt. Without an interview, without going on site, if you can't distinguish the difference between an aluminum siding and a clapboard, how can we use that as justification that from the streetscape, we have a negative um, attribute to a historic district? It, logically doesn't make sense to me. So I'm choosing to exercise my discretion because a recommendation that is written nationally that applies to properties that are in different climates than ours, I don't think necessarily applies to what, to what we should be looking at and I absolutely agree. First priority is preservation of structure versus decorative appearance. 
I'd rather the building be there for the long term than have it deteriorate to the point that only demolition will be the effective corrective measure. That's why I voted the way I did. Thank you, yeah, this has certainly been a journey. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. I've actually driven by the building. But at the end of the day, and, uh, you know, I think Rick has made a very persuasive argument, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, essentially I view this building as very important to the city, the residents of the city, and it's located in historical district. And I truly believe that the application of vinyl siding will take away from, uh, you know, the history of the building and take away from you know, what we're trying to preserve in that historic district. And we've looked at other applications where people are committed to their properties and they're making investments required to, and I read this in the paper today, maintain the historical accurately style and design of the building. And I felt that we would be losing that. It was something that, you know, was critically important and as a community, we did not want to lose. Um, you know, when I read the uh, the city ordinance, when I read the city code, when I, I read the shipper letters and the recommendations, um, you know, first there's the fact that um, I'm not sure how vinyl got such a bad rap, especially the product that is available today. I understand 20 years ago when it didn't look or act anything like wood, but um, you know, and it got a bad rap and that's what we're dealing with because no one has a problem with plastic tiles up on top of a roof to, uh, to substitute for slate. No one has, um, a problem with the cement siding that people are using. Those are not like for like. So who are we kidding when we say that, yeah, we're going to do like for like. We're not, we're, we're, we're going to approve plastic tiles up on a roof because someone's done a really good job of making it look like slate. Um, because the reality is, unless you have an incredible amount of money to invest in a home in Plattsburgh, New York, which some people do, and that's a wonderful thing. However, if you don't have access to that kind of financing, to say that people have to replace like for like is to condemn a whole lot of buildings in this city, I believe. And when I think of like for like, you know, if someone's um, coming before us and saying, yeah, we want to tear the, we're going to, you know, redo the house and we're going to tear down the, uh, the, the tower that's on it. Well, yeah, then, yeah, that's not like for like. Whoa, buddy. No, 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 no. The building is going to still look like the same building if quality vinyl siding is put on. That's what we have been shown. And I believe that in, in our city, we need to be supporting homeowners who want to invest in their homes and keep them keep them standing for the next generation. And not everyone can afford to pay double the price of buying the home to go ahead and replace all those materials, many of which aren't even available anymore. So, you know, this like for like discussion, if we're talking about the old courthouse down, you know, in city center, you know, that thing is, I mean, that's such an, an extraordinary piece of work. And obviously we would want to do everything in our power to, um, to preserve it. But when you're talking about homes where people live and where they're paying their taxes and where they're cutting their lawn and washing their windows and they're trying to make the place, you know, be able to maintain its structural integrity, I don't think that bankrupting someone is the way to go 
if they want to hold on to the quality of their home. Thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so since my time starting on this board, I have asked the question numerous times of staff, um, you know, the different staff that have been supporting, uh, you know, the planning board role, uh, the function of these historic districts, you know, and the questions have come up everything from are these, you know, formalized historic districts, you know, what are the regulations and the, and the standards that we should be applying uh, to uh, for applications for these districts. Um, you know, and then the same thing typically has always come back. These are recognized historic districts. They're recognized historic properties. Um, and we have, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, an ordinance that is very well centered around in-kind replacement and, and preservation. Um, I, you know, when I go down and I look through uh, the references to the federal standards, which when I came onto the board, I was handed the book. Uh, which was a hard copy of the federal standards for historic preservation. Um, you know, they're pretty in-kind centered, uh, you know, in terms of, yes, there's a lot of should, there's a lot of what's appropriate and what's not. But when it all comes back to it, it's focused around in-kind replacement of existing materials, existing architectural features, maintaining uh not replacing, uh, except absolutely when necessary. Um, our ordinance goes one step further and actually says when something is to be replaced, it's supposed to match in composition, design, color, texture, other visual qualities. So our ordinance takes that one step further. Um, in this regard, I also, uh, uh, you know, staff has done a great supporting job in going back and looking at our history as a board, looking at applications and other properties actually were referenced within this application. There was nothing found within a contributory building where this board um, or supporting permit has been to, uh, uh, you know, replace and put vinyl siding on uh, a contributing building. Um, you know, this board did make a decision, uh, which is part of that report, a non-contributing building, uh, which was the specific reasoning uh, for the board, and it was part of the motion to approve vinyl siding on that one property, which is part of the report from staff. Um, so with, with that said, uh, the board also within this, uh, you know, within the last year, I believe, maybe the last two years, uh, has, has considered another application for vinyl siding where this, this board did send that applicant back to a position where they could not consider their application any further for vinyl siding. And that was, uh, I believe, a majority of this board that did that that reviewed and looked at that application in that position. Um, in addition, uh, you know, this applicant has, has, has done a diligent job in their application. They've, they have uh, continued a numerous um, uh, reviews with the State Historic Preservation Office, which has also been another thing that this board has supported in applications, uh, numerous applications uh, over the last several years. In the, the uh, many back and forth with the Historic Preservation Office, which once again, this board has always, I, I do not know of an application where they have, have not um, accepted or considered uh, professionally the opinion of the Historic Preservation Office, um, where they indicated that vinyl siding is generally not an appropriate replacement siding material, historic wood siding. Um, you know, with, with that said, that is, that is how I arrived at the vote, uh, that I arrived at tonight. Um, I will, I will reiterate, we're in the middle of a, of a brand new comprehensive plan for the city. Um, within that comprehensive plan, there will be rewrites to the zoning ordinance. Um, I, I strongly suggest that all public be involved in that process and that 
you know, if we want to truly uh, allow some of these properties to uh, be maintained as applicants want to maintain them, uh, then they should, you know, people should get involved in the comprehensive plan, provide a better, a, a, a different level of guidance within the zoning ordinance in terms of historic property. Thank you. Can I make one last comment? Sure. Um, I think what makes me most proud to sit on this board is the passion that all of us have for whatever decision, whatever vote we cast, whatever basis. And like I said before, um, generally it comes from your historic perspective, you know, why you're here today. Um, I really appreciate everybody's opinions, everybody's basis for their decision. Um, whether we agree or not, I think we can all agree that um, we execute our passions, our commitments, and that's why we're here today. So to each of you, thank you. I mean, I think this is the way it should be. We shouldn't have to agree on all decisions that are made, but we should respect each other and that's, that's where we come from. Jim, thank, thank you. I mean, you've uh, put together a compelling argument. Um, your presentation, your, your willingness to cooperate with the board, I respect that and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a fun ride. Thank you. Well, then I'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank everybody. you. Jim, are you going to hand it over to Rick now? Yes. Uh, Rick, you're going to uh, uh, follow through with uh, remaining application items? Yes. Are you going to stay on, Jim? Yes. Yes. Okay. So item number two, um, planning board number 22-02-115 Court Street, historic site review. Cherise, can you, Shirley, can you give us a rundown of the application, please? Sure, um, so this is a historic site review application. It's one block over from the property that we were just looking at at 115 Court Street. Um, in the Court Street Historic District. It's a request to perform a series of restorations, including roof replacement, in kind structural repairs and courses, and in kind repairs to trim and damage to a contributing historic building in the Court Street Historic District. Uh, the applicant and planning preparer is Sharon Sanford, the owner of the property. Um, this is an image of the property from the southwest corner of Court and Lane Street. Your the image shows that it is an RHW district and it was in the sorry, I actually reused the image from the last application because this property over here at the very right edge of the screen was the court, um, located in the court city historic district. This is an image of what the property essentially looks like today. Um, some deterioration found along the uh, siding, the porch columns, some of the porch um, floor and ceiling is rotted as well, but I don't see here. I think some of the windows may be as well. Um, and some of the roof, or maybe all of the roof, is in pretty poor condition as well. Um, this is another image of the property from the east, or looking at it uh, facing the east. Uh, the materials are in the application, and I can pull up the full materials um, as provided in the application. However, this is the only material that is not an ace kind of placement that the applicant is proposing. Uh, this is considered as the Vinci brand multi width slate, um, synthetic slate. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not 100% certain on the color they're using. I do have the samples up in my office, and I know some of you have come in to see them. 
Fire action. Would you mind running and grabbing that? It's on the corner of my desk. So sure. It's sweet. Yeah. Uh, Thank uh, you, So we do have a sample of what that would look like um, visually and texturally. It is very similar to sweet. Um, however, we have a different composition. Uh, I did reach out to our contact at Tyndall very early on. Uh, in review of this application to ask about this slate, and it was something new that I did not quite see before. And uh, Western Thoughts, now with the State for Preservation Office, is that we do sometimes accept closely, and this specific product tends to be a pretty good match for the real thing. Typically, the applicant would need to show that the existing slate is beyond repair. Um, individual slates can often be repaired, which can be a big cost saving, but it can be difficult to find skilled workers. Willing and able to do that type of work there. Um, it might not be something that's economically feasible in the sense that it might not be an available service to the non local economy. Um, the new slate color should match the historic and flow through the possible so that you can not spare it with that. Um, a formal referral was sent to the State Historic Preservation Office and a response received approximately a week and a half ago. Um, they note that the court street, as I the one that this property is listed on the state national registers. Um, it's a contributing resource to the court street historic district, and they understand the scope of work will include rehabilitation to exterior screen, replacement of the slate roofing with cloak slate, restoration of a court feature, and preservation and painting of the wood side. Uh, based on this review, Chippo did state that they believe that the proposed work is appropriate. The historic building district. Uh, if you want to just pass it, and if you see one, just take a look and pass it down. I believe that they are proposing to do either the third or the fourth uh, gray color for the top. Uh, sorry, the folks slate would be accessible in this case, provided that the existing slate is deteriorated beyond the visible repair and that substitute material matches the color and style of the historic slate as closely as possible. Um, restoration of the same sort of features to be such as important columns or work areas should be based on provision of physical and documentary evidence, which we do have in the building in important form and um, existing millwork and certain areas that are still located as property. Um, in this case, <coughs> the only recommendation staff wise that we have for you is that you may want to acquire the applicant regarding the status of the slate roof uh, before we can determine um, the appropriateness of the material. But other than that, we have no further staff comments. Pull up the staff report because that was not shared with you guys at the time of the earlier today. Is the applicant represented? She is. They, she is on as well as her representatives. Let me pull them both over. <clears throat> Jerry Stafford. Um, the most recent utilization of the property, to the best of my knowledge, was out of the Adirondack Theater Company. It's an estate of some care. Uh, the contributing structure um, is a, it, it is a contributing structure within the North Street Historic District. It's on the wood frame and not for siding. It's noted for the following distinguishing features in the building report one, uh, my first, the first one, uh, the polygonal short story, two and a half story turret. Uh, period veranda with square section columns, stained glass window, and tabernacle frame, plain windows, racks, and heavy lintels, and the elliptical windows. Um, it is considered a substantial example of the Queen's Queen Anne style of architecture. Um, which happens to be the stage. <laughs> go this way better. <clears throat> Um, it is an intact example in good condition. It can be included in several classical techniques, and the building can be considered an addition towards colonial revival. Um, again, Chico had noted that based on their review, they believe the proposed work is appropriate for the historic building in the district. Um, the applicant provided the 
Well, let's hear from the applicant. Uh, Ms. Antry, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate watching. I've been on here since 5.30 and I, I am really appreciative of all the hard work your board does. It's, I'm familiar with uh, another historical association and uh, it, it's worthy of uh, a big applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to uh, go through your application for us? Uh, sure. Um, with just a little bit of background so you know who I am, because I think, uh, you know, I just sort of appeared out of nowhere. Uh, I moved to Plattsburgh when I was 15 years old uh, to live with my family. You might know them. Um, Dick and Connie Brigowski, they were educators at Beekman Town and uh, Sable Forks. Um, I went to SUNY Plattsburgh and always considered since then, Plattsburgh is my hometown, regardless of the fact that I am a born Canadian. <laughs> so um, I purchased a house in Valpour in 2004 and renovated that. And as a matter of fact, it was the Redden family summer camp uh, that I purchased. And uh, we have enjoyed, my husband and I have enjoyed that since 2004. We did a mighty um, restora renovation that was not a restoration project. It was a camp, it was an actual renovation, which is very different from a restoration. So, um, my contractor, Paul Golden, and I don't know, Shalise, is Paul in the waiting room? Do you see him there? Okay, so he's, it was because I was going to attend the, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Um, he is there. I, I did promote him to a panelist, but I think there might be some action on his side that he needs to take in order to come uh, on. Okay. And I'm not sure if he stepped away. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so my contractor, Paul Golden, who uh, worked with us in Balcor, he's been with me for 20 years. We've always said, you know, let's find a property. I, by education, am, have a master's in art history, and I'm in, I am um, a preservationist by nature. So 
Paul sent me the Zillow uh, listing. My husband and I happened to be flying into town two days later for uh, the Christmas holidays. And uh, I drove by and I didn't even have to go into the house. It is magnificent. It, I, I was heartbroken to see the condition it's in and how it has been allowed not allowed uh, because I understand with your board members um, saying, you know, it takes money. It really does. It takes funding to keep up a historic house that's 130 years old. There's a lot that can go wrong. All the elements over the years, especially in the North Country with sleet and rain and heat and whatever. So uh, I did make an appointment and walked through and, and said, you know, this needs to be saved. And I'm very fortunate that I have the wherewithal to do that. And my husband is on board with it. Um, we want to bring it into our personal family as somewhere to, uh, even though we have the house down in Valcour, somewhere to, to spend our holidays and have guests, our, our friends and family stay over, enjoy sitting on the front porch like they did 130 years ago, having iced tea or an adult beverage, whatever. So, so that's where I'm coming from, is this is a property that absolutely needs to be um, brought back from the brink. So you can ask me questions if you'd like. Okay. Um, any board members have questions? I think this is a very exciting project. I mean, just reading through the application and being, Thank you. you know, somewhat familiar with that building, I think this is really exciting and a great thing for our community. So I wish you, uh, you know, everything. Thank you. Yes. Well, Currently, um, there isn't a lot happening, of course, until we get permits. However, Paul Golden is um, working on the applications for complete upgrade of HVAC. You know, all the infrastructure, we have to take care of that first before um, anything else happens inside, because I know there was a, a freeze and the um, original radiators, some of them burst and there was water damage and ceilings, whatever. So he is working up the permits for, we will be doing um, restoring the original radiators and the hot water heat with a, with, um, a boiler, all the interior plumbing, we will have instant hot water tanks. Um, of course, the electric has to be upgraded, um, probably bring in 400 amps of electric. Um, we will get the roof assessed. And I, I really appreciate the board member uh, who said, you know, plastic roofing. Um, this is not plastic roofing. This is a synthetic product that has been tested in many environments. Uh, it is an energy star product. It um, is snow resistant, sleet resistant, rain resistant. There's already been a huge flood uh, in the attic. I'm going to have to replace a, a good portion of the turret area, um, as well as the master bedroom ceiling, whatever. So um, you, not a whole lot will happen until the weather gets nice on the exterior, but on the interior, interior, you can be assured that we are, we're working on that infrastructure, cleaning up the basement, hopefully pouring a cement floor because it's a dirt basement floor and doing all that infrastructure and looking for re replacement radiators. Right. Kurt, did you? Yeah, well, I have a couple questions. Uh, hi, Sharon. Thanks for the application. So, yeah. obviously, we've been held that our, that, our, that our board spends a lot of time considering the replacement of materials and 
what in kind means and, and so on. And I'm curious right now in the application, it looks like the only place where you may not be doing an in kind replacement is on the synthetic slate roof. I'm yes, that's, that's correct. Is that correct that everything else is an in kind wood for wood replacement? Yes, yes. Paul has, um, I consulted with Paul, the, for instance, on my application. Um, let's see, I, I have my list here. Facias and soffits will be replaced with pine, which is the current material. Um, front and side porch ceilings are tongue and groove. Um, tongue and groove. Oh, you have that up too. Okay. Um, tongue and glue, groove Douglas fir. Uh, we will be using cedar frame basement windows. Well, I have actually, they may not be cedar, but they will be wood. And I also want to do impact resistant windows to um, deter vandalism or anyone being able to get into the basement. Uh, because right now there are iron bars like a prison and, and that doesn't belong on a house like that. So um, uh, we will be, um, the, the front porch is problem, the front porch staircase and the side porch staircase are problematic. I can't find original photos. I do have sort of a glimpse of what the front staircase used to look like, which would have been a um, concrete or possibly granite staircase with side, side granite with the railing on the top coming straight out. And that was in Dr. Chingo's photo um, that was on one of your documents. So I still have to research that, but I'm trying very, very hard to find out exactly what the front and real porch looked like. Um, the, the stone piers, um, we'll be jacking up the front porch and side porch, dismant, completely dismantling the stone piers using the same material to rebuild um, that uh, for structural integrity. Basement windows, as I said, we have to see what is gonna work best with that. Um, the rear porch, uh, let's see. As you know, the, rim, the, the I don't know what happened to the rear porch. That's heartbreaking. <laughs> that got ripped off. And uh, we can only follow what's existing on the side, you know, on the side of the house right now and recreate um, what the front porch looks like with the same balusters, the slate roof, the, the pine columns, the trim, whatever. And what else do we have? The French doors, um, I'm going to have to custom have those custom made because the French doors that I'm finding now are only 84 inch doors, whereas that opening is some 90 Paul knows, 92 or 94. So um, I may have to go to a custom door for that. Uh, but in the meantime, since it may be an extremely long uh, uh, delivery date, if we could sort of box out and I could buy just an interim French door that's an, an, that's an 84 inch door and put that in, just for security's sake, that's where the, the um, vandalism happened. Apparently they came in through that side window and, and busted out the door and busted out that window. And then um, if you look at the third floor, there are pilasters on the sides of the windows, grooved pilasters, sort of Grecian column looking. There's evidence on the first and second floor that, yeah, um, Shalise, if you move it down, probably almost toward the end, there's a picture of three, a three-paned uh, window. And 
there's evidence from the trim on the first floor and the second floor where there were dowels that those pilasters were appliqued onto the trim. Actually, let's, there you go. That's it. So, so those pilasters actually appeared on all, every single window in that house. Um, what is missing in this photo in that pink on the top would have been maybe a ribbon and flower, you know, a ribbon and flower um, garland, or it could have been three rosettes. I don't know. Um, but there are dowel marks there that indicate there was um, an applique of some sort over all the windows. So that is all going to be milled um, out of pine. Um, I do have a mill right. So um, I'm looking really forward to it. I get so excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> in that picture, hold on just a second, Joyce. In this picture just below the windows, it looks like there's some like crisscrossing siding work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. That's uh, that's original. That's um, it, 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 in place of a fish scale. That's a historic type of um, frieze that does go all the way around the house, and it's it's spectacular. It's Is that able to be restored? Well, we're gonna have to see uh, once we get up there, scrape it, and and if. If there are areas of rot, we will replace that. We will replicate that somehow, but it will be replicated. I can guarantee you that. I don't know exactly because we haven't been able to get a scissor lift up there really to see really hands-on what's there. And then some of the windows have interesting like curvature to them. Uh, yes. Or any, of yes. Those, or any of those damaged and in need of replacement? Um, we are fortunate. The only curved windows in the house are the um, living room. Uh, I don't have the living room um, bow on the front porch. Uh, they're the only curved windows in the entire house. Fortunately, they have storm windows over them that have protected them. And I am just hoping we can, we can get in there and, and do some shoring up of that to protect them, perhaps with plexiglass panels while all the other work is getting done, um, just to avoid any kind of incidental damage, you know, construction damage due to construction. So we're very, we're very conscious of taking care of those curved glass windows. They'll be expensive if I have to replace those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Along the, uh, the replacement in repair lines, the stained glass windows, are, do you have um, any intent in making those more energy efficient? Uh, yes, um, there are currently old, old, old storm panels uh, with original storm window frames, which will either, will keep those frames if it's, if it's viable, otherwise they'll be recreated with more of a clear um, impact resistant a uh, glass panel rather than just a plastic or a, it would be impact glass. Okay. Um, absolutely. And, the, and it would be permanent. I, they would be not permanent. You can remove them, but my inclination is to keep that window always protected. Um, I worked on the um, restoration of some church stained glass uh, not restoration, I didn't do the restoration, the preservation. Uh, and that's what we did in a church down in Westchester was custom um, plexiglass at the time, but I 
prefer to use impact resistant glass, which has more of a translucent glass look to it. Then plexiglass can cloud, it can scratch with weather. Uh, so I think the impact resistant glass is gonna do a much nicer job. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's such an essential element to the character of the building. I, I yes. appreciate your attention to that. Yes, and actually there's one tiny crack. Oh no. That's hard. There's one tiny crack and one pane and you're very welcome. I'm gonna be up there from May to November uh, working on the house. I'm in Florida, I live in Key West. Full time, supposedly full time, but I think I'm moving back to Plattsburgh with this. Um, but uh, yeah, there's one tiny crack that I'm I'm really nervous about. So you know, the sooner we can get working on this, the better. As far as just containing it for now, because I'm just so afraid that the next strong wind is just gonna, you know, the next snow squall that I see on the news is just going to, you know, just add to the deterioration. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Loretta, yeah. or Jen, do you have anything you'd like to bring up? No, I'll just say that, uh, Sharon, I'm excited about this project. It is Thank one of you. the most beautiful homes in the neighborhood. Thank you. And, yes, um, Yeah, you don't want to break that... Um, the curved glass, um, no, the glass. I, I restored a house on Brinkerhof and in the construction, one of those got broken. Oh, and no. well, no. It, it, fortunately, a window was donated to replace it oh. to um, someone who was committed to the project that I was working on and they donated a, a beveled uh, concave glass. Uh, because that's a cost that's prohibitive, but it's going to be beautiful. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe we should start a Wednesday wine this summer, so you can all come over every Wednesday night and, <laughs> and see what we've done. Sit on that porch. No, it's like it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be beautiful, and and we've got some wonderful craft people in the area, and yes. um, yeah. and I actually yeah. do love the roof you're going to put up. I had a slate roof that crumbled. My home is very old. It's uh, was built in 1890, and um, that product that you're doing, um, the resin. I've always thought yeah. resin was plastic, yeah. but correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, um, I wish that had been around when we had to replace our roof. Yeah, roof because the I photographs of that product, it's it's a beautiful product, and um, right. it's going to be a stunning addition to the house. Thank you. It's going to take about two years, I think. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> Especially with the inside, because, you know, there's no, the previous owner, uh, well, there was no kitchen. Everything had been ripped out, and the previous owner um, put a bathroom in the kitchen. And I think they might have been going to do a kitchenette or something. But I am restoring the butler's pantry area i'm not closing it off because now it's more open plan uh, that people like or that i like uh butler's pantry but i'm i'm um we're recreating my millwright is going to make the kitchen cabinets uh replicas of the doors in the rest of the house out of the same material so uh and stained all the same as, as the interior doors and woodwork. So I'm hoping that it all really becomes a show place. Um, you know, it's something, I didn't have children, so this is my child <laughs> in my retirement. <laughs> Jim, any questions? Um, I don't have any questions, just a couple comments. So Sharon, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your application. Uh, you you truly you. do have a beautiful property. Um, yes. Uh, you know, with a lot of, a lot of potential. I, I, I had a little bit of experience with uh, the prior owner who I believe in sort of inherited it from the prior owner to that. Um, 
and well from yeah from what i understand it was when it was uh foreclosed on with the bnb uh it was vacant for about seven years and then deutsche bank uh donated it to the theater group uh, I also know members of the theater group. As a matter of fact, I dated one of them in the 60s. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I won't say which one. <laughs> but uh, they're all lovely people. And, uh, you know, maybe we can hold a fundraiser for the theater group there when, when all this is said and done. <laughs> so th thank you again for, you know, once again, looking at this property and, you know, and bring, bringing the enthusiasm yeah. and investment Thank to it. You. You Thank know. you. And, you know, I'm, I'm up for any suggestions from your board. I appreciate, as I said before, opening, um, you know, you guys do really hard work here in Key West. We have the historical association, you know, review committee, and they're extremely strict, right down to the color of the shutters you can put on your house. So I'm familiar with the process um, and I appreciate everything that, that you're doing and that you plan to evolve as, because I understand this is, is sort of, I don't know how long your board, your historic board has been uh, in existence, but you know, it's an evolving thing. And if I can help at all too, I, I'd be very glad to when I'm up north. Good. Well, I guess welcome home is an appropriate phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We love Plattsburgh. And actually my husband's a Long Islander, but he considers Plattsburgh his hometown now too. <laughs> so, Wonderful. And we have lots of family up there. All, they're all educators, so. So, uh, well, you know. welcome home. Um, Thank you. We, Thank we you. do have a, a seeker. Uh, four seeker, we have four seeker. Before, okay. Um, we open the public hearing. Oh. Sorry, Shimmer, I just have one more question. We didn't talk at all about what looks like the outbuilding or the garage or anything in the back. Uh, what, what we what we think we're we would like to do uh, that garage someone tore down probably the original beautiful carriage house or barn or whatever it was we would probably enclose the existing this new structure um and and uh copy create the same roof angle as the main house, which would have happened, which would have been there when it was originally built. So we would get an architect to come and somehow clad that building in, an, in a new exterior with more appropriate doors that look more like carriage house doors. Um, so it would, look more like an a like a period appropriate um carriage house i would i would think and but that's another that's another project that's going to have to go that's like that's going to be our workshop for all this for now okay. and actually in that garage is that um handicap lift that the theater group had to install and they installed that in the garage. So I don't think I'm going to need that. I hope I won't need it. So we have to decide what we're going to do with that also. And does the project involve any new fencing from the neighbor properties or any landscaping? Uh, I, or I plan at the very end, of course, we're going to have equipment coming in and whatever, but um, I noticed that on the other corner of William Street, uh, there's a beautiful black wrought iron um, Victorian fence, and I would love to do a fence application when I'm ready uh, to do a Victorian fence around the property and restore the driveway after all the heavy equipment is gone. Um, so that would be a, a future application I would put in. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let's open the public hearing. Only on my Kathy is her contractor. Okay. I don't think I think she's that way. Okay. Well, there being no comment, um, public hearing is closed. We have a seeker. Would you like to run through it, Choice? Okay. You guys all have the part one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, so for anybody watching, um, what I will do is I will read each of these environmental questions uh, to the board. If I hear no response, I will check no or small impact may occur. Um, if the board or any member of the board uh, feels that it warrants further discussion, they will speak up and the board will discuss and eventually direct me to check the other. One the other box. The proposed action create a material conflict with an adopted land use plan or zoning regulation. Will the proposed action result in a change in the use or intensity of use of land? Will the proposed action impair the character or quality of the existing community? Will the proposed action have an impact on the environmental characteristics that cause the establishment of a critical environmental area? Will the proposed action result in an adverse change in the existing level of traffic or affect existing infrastructure for mass transit, hiking, or walk traffic? Will the proposed action cause an increase in the use of energy and it fails to incorporate reasonably available energy conservation or renewable energy opportunities? Will the proposed action impact existing public or private water supplies? Will the proposed action impact, uh, impact existing public or private wastewater treatment utilities? <laughs> Will the proposed action impair the character or quality of important historic, archaeological, architectural, or aesthetic resources? Will the proposed action result in an adverse change to natural resources, for example, wetlands, water bodies, groundwater, air quality, flora, and fauna? Will the proposed action result in an increase in the potential for erosion, flooding, or drainage problems? Will the proposed action create a hazard to environmental resources or human health? If no response to these, I will check the appropriate box for a negative that it will not result in any significant adverse environmental impacts and will coordinate with chairman to pursue it. Okay. Um. There is a uh, seeker resolution. Uh, it's the standard template resolution we have, which just included to say, or it's not in packet. Uh, so, 22-02A is the environmental uh, resolution. Again, this is the standard template um, plug in and negative information in the fact statement as an unlisted action. So I'll make a motion on planning word application 22 dash 02 115 part street for site review for a negative declaration on the seeker. 
then realizing now that the uh, agenda is 2021-11, so I apologize for that. But to confirm her, that was 22-02-A. I'll second that motion. Yeah, yeah. Roll call. Uh, Kurt, I'm sorry. Greg Carter? Yes. Kurt Burbage? Yes. Loretta Rizuma? Yes. Jim Abdella? Yes. Rick Perry? Yes. And then we also have the standard approval resolution 22 0 2 Shalise, can you scroll down on the motion a little bit? I should say up, sorry. The secret one? No, on the resolution the the for the application. Is that 20, 22-02B? Yes, it is. Okay. I'll I'll make a motion to uh, move forward resolution 22-02B. Um, under the motion, uh, I'd also recognize the uh, condition um, that with the alternative roofing, uh, that it uh, be utilized in, a, in accordance with recommendations from SHPO, you know, where uh, the existing slate roofing is deteriorated to the point where, you know, alternative roofing is required. What's that motion? So I just want to ask a question of the board, I guess, because on a previous application for a similar project, we gave an awful lot of scrutiny and we had, you know, we had like highlighting of photographs of areas to be restored and in this case, what we have are photographs with some text on them. We don't have engineering designs. We don't have an architect's design. And I just want to make sure that we are treating each application equally. Is what we have here equivalent to what we have asked of other applicants? I'd like to comment on that. My understanding is the photographs are meant to record the existing property, 23 yards and the applicant has committed to replace or restore those details in time. So I believe that's the record. I would say that in the in the motion, um, we should elaborate on some of the specifics. Um, Jim, is is that okay with you? That that's fine. Okay. Um, I would say what we should do is go through some of the the detail um, with respect to the scope of the work. Yeah. Um, it can just make that specifically part of the part of the motion along with um, the the like kind of materials that uh, have been uh, presented as replacement material for the rotted material. The other thing I'd like to clarify, it goes back to the original motion. It's my understanding the roof is being replaced. As opposed to sections, just my question is, what's correct? Are we replacing the entire room or just sections that require replacement? 
That's a, that's a good question. The note that we have says the main and core grooves replaced with slate or synthetic slate material, but we don't have verification on portions. So we can ask, yeah. Is it? So we can ask, yeah. Um, may, I, may I say something? The letter that I read from the state said that if it was determined by, I would imagine, a roofer, a licensed roofer, that the entire roof is deteriorated, then yes, I could proceed with the synthetic roof. If the roofer assessed only portions of the roof were deteriorated, I had to replace with actual slate. Is that incorrect? No, that's incorrect. Do we have the letter? I didn't see it. Yeah. Which I'm I'm perfectly fine with either solution. However, uh, you know, this roof is already a hundred years old. So I hate putting a Band-Aid on something like this to risk. So just to make sure I understand, one alternative is to replace damaged slate with slate. Correct. The other alternative yes. is to replace the entire roof with synthetic slate. Is that correct? Yes. And do we have, has an option been selected at this point? Well, she, she's going to have the evaluation of a professional roofer. Okay. And then she'll make the, de the determination. Okay. Um, so if it's A or B. Yeah. If it's, if it's substantial um, patchwork, she'd probably opt for the overall replacement. Yeah. Um, well, it, isn't that up to your board to approve e according to the roofer's finding? Wouldn't so, I hand his finding to you for the final determination? So, so to answer your qu question, Miss Santry, that's that's how I I believe that is a potential of what the board has to consider. Um, yes, you know, I understood it to be that. Yeah, and and, and uh, getting back to your question, Kurt, earlier, uh, you know, given some of the applications we've had here, I believe that is some of the balancing point of what the board has to consider. You know, uh, I would say and feel very comfortable that in past applications, uh, albeit this application has some pretty considerable, like, uh, you know, you're looking at much larger portions of the home and and. But in past applications, this board has uh, considered a like for like replacement with a picture and a verbal description, uh, has accepted that as an application uh, presentation. With that said, you know, the board does have a balancing point on, you know, how much of that do you want represented in an architectural plan versus a verbal description and pictures? Uh, to Rick's point, how much, and I, I'm open within my motion uh, to consider, you know, how much of that application does the board want to detail in bullet points within the resolution? Um, we've done some of that in the past, not on all applications, but if the board wants to clarify that further, I'm surely open to uh, modifying my resolution or my motion. So, Jim, what's the current motion? Can you restate what the, what is the motion on the table? So, my I believe my motion is to you know to accept resolution twenty two dash o two b with the condition noted that alternative roofing be approved in accordance with recommendations from Shippo, uh, where alternative roofing is required. I think I had stated there also that in. Uh, uh, in accordance with their verbiage, that if, if the slate has deteriorated to the point requiring uh, replacement. So maybe, I guess the, the amendment that I would make, so I'll offer an amendment to the motion, and, and that amendment would be that the, the page and the photos that we have that are labeled scope of work, 
and there are 10 points. And the text on that page is the same as the captions on the photos, which is nice. So I guess if we're, if we're clarifying, then I would say that the, the, the motion to approve 2202 115 Court Street include the, the 10 bulleted points outlined in the scope of work. And your statement about SHPO would come with those in that scope of work. The other thing that we might want to include, Kurt, there's a document labeled Historic Site Review Application, uh, Supplemental Information. And it describes, I think, in a fair amount of detail, uh, the overall spirit and what the uh, applicant is committing to as a related to the project. Okay. You know, as an example, this restoration returned the structure to its original condition and renewed its position as one of the premier Victorian homes in City of Glasgow, replicating architectural features that have been destroyed, damaged, or removed over the last hundred plus years. I think that's very specific. Yeah, I think if we start trying to go through every bit of um, restoration that's going to be involved, this is a monumental undertaking. And, um, you know, I suspect that a new roof is going to be needed. I suspect that once they get up into the roof, um, it, it's going to be clear that... Um, putting a new roof on is going to be, you got to have a good roof. If you're going to invest in restoring this kind of a house to that level of magnificence, you got to have a good roof on top of it. And so, um, and Shippo has, um, has said that they're comfortable with a resin roof, with a synthetic roof. Um, so, you know, but if we try to go through, you know, nail by nail on how this house is going to be restored, we're going to be here for a month of Sundays. So, um, you know, I personally am comfortable with the level of detail that's provided in the document that we have before us. I think we're all pretty clear on, on what this project is all about and that um, in, every, in, in every situation confronted possible, uh, it's going to be best of practice best uh best available products are going to be used to uh to bring this home to its uh former glory jim are you open to uh amending the resolution yes okay um kurt do you want to just so the motion would still be to adopt 22-02B. We would just include whatever this comment is in the petitions or the discussion section. Yeah, can, can we say to include the scope of work as well as the uh, we call it other parties? Yeah. It is, it is. So, exactly. Okay. Yeah. In detail as presented. Yeah. yeah. And what that, Jim, what, uh, what we've been discussing is um, the application as a whole includes the scope of work as it's defined here. Um, would your motion be amended to just simply say the application as presented um, without any need of bullet pointing everything all over again? I, I'm I'm in support of that. That the the uh, ten I believe it was the ten point scope of work that was just outlined. Yeah. Uh, be reiterated within the conditions of the resolution. Yeah. Um, in in addition to my comment about uh, roofing and and compliance with SHPO, um, I might also add in there uh, as a, as a condition that uh, you know 
there may be other significant work that comes up, which Ms. Santria has pointed out, you know, for instance, fencing, uh, the, the, the secondary uh, garage or, or carriage structure, um, you know, that the uh, code enforcement building department feel comfortable that there may be additional referrals that come to our board um, outside of this resolution. Makes sense. Outside the inside, I didn't turn up. Outside the original application. Well, I'm sorry, what was that? Does this count for that correctly? I missed part of what you said. Um, I can't I I can't see your oh, screen okay. at the moment. Sorry. as determined by the building inspector and, and may require future fruit future referrals uh, to the board. So then we've then in, in in my motion we've generally recognized that there's other items that were discussed. You know those items that we understand are going to have future detail or are future phases of the work and that we recognize that that the applicant may be coming back to us for those. Okay. Shalise, I think it would be when, oh, okay, where, yeah, that was awkward. Okay, you got it. Yeah. So Jim, you good with the motion as it's written? I believe that captures what we've discussed and and the motion that I've agreed to. Reg, you want to re-second? A second. Okay. Um, is there further discussion? No further discussion. Roll call. Correct. Yes. 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 Sharon, your application has been approved when- uh, Thank you so much, I am when, thrilled. Just one last comment. Um, when you define the scope of work beyond this application, um, the, if you consult with the building inspector, if he feels it's necessary to come back to the planning board. We Absolutely. Are Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And, and I really uh, look forward to your guidance on this project because uh, Plattsburgh is, is very special to me. So um, I would like to be part of a revitalization. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody need to take a minute or two? Dean, uh, sorry if the rest. Actually, I'm sorry, before we do, uh, I did get a notification that the window crew will be returning at 8.30. We cannot leave this window on board for the evening. OK. Uh, so they will be hammering away at this in about 15 minutes. In 15 minutes. Okay. So let this door man go, right? <laughs> OK. So let's, let's move on. Next application, 22-02 um, Latour subdivision. Joyce, uh, do you want to introduce yeah. the application? Well, these ones I have a pretty short presentation. Uh, the first one is the Latour subdivision is Uh, by the uh, by Ricky Turner Tour, the transfer is being Lazarus. 
Uh, this is a map showing that the location of the property is on the corner of Waterhouse Street and Hartwell Street. Um, it is zone R1. And this is a general picture of the subdivision. Uh, I do not have this one colorized, but essentially, and I apologize to those online if you can't see where my mouse is. Uh, but this <laughs> section right here, this 19.5 foot uh, by approximately 128 foot section is part of lot one. Um, and it is proposed that they subdivide the section and uh, a condition of approval as recommended by the community development office is that this new lot two, this uh, sliver here will be conveyed and merged to this neighboring parcel right here, uh, tax act number 221.11-2-9, also owned by the schoolers. Um, that is the gist of the application. I do have a zoning table. One quick note, there's only one deficiency in this zoning table. It is a uh, lot width of proposed lot. Um, the lot two lot. after the merger with the neighboring lot, it's deficient by half a foot. However, I have confirmed with the building inspector's office that uh, the current lot width of the neighboring parcel is 55 feet. So this is an improvement on a pre-existing deficiency. It does not be a barrier. Perfect. Thank you. Um, basically, you know, the subdivision checklist is pretty standard. The only question I guess I, uh, I have is just for clarification. Um, the, uh, on the second item down, uh, all existing structures, wooded areas, streams, you know, there's significant physical features within the portion to be subdivided and within 200 feet thereof. It's in the code, unfortunately. It's so, so basically, that's really including every physical feature. Could be three lots over, four I, lots over. The, the board has the uh, ability okay. to use that. Okay. So because okay. One of the notes in the zoning code, and the note that made it to me, staff review of this application, is the zoning code section 4 A sketch plan requires um, any. Properties that are located within 200 feet of the subdivision of the map. Um, that is kind of accepted, I think. It's it it creates a problem for myself as a land surveyor as I don't have authorization after all. But the board okay. is under the voting code, they are permitted to leave any criteria as part of the I just lost audio from City Hall. Can you hear us now? No, I can hear you. I can hear you now. Uh, what was the last thing you heard? Uh, board consideration. Uh, so yes, the board is able to waive any submission criteria that they feel is, sorry, I have to look up the actual code citation. In the past, we spent some time since we've, I've had a presentation to the uh, city planning board for uh, subdivision of lands. Uh, and our yeah. surveying services have been within the property being surveyed. You know, they've gone out 200 feet beyond. And right. I just want to make sure for clarification uh, because it, there's more detailed follow up review than it has been five years ago. Um, yeah, and that's just that's why I'm asking this for Okay. Here, let me show you guys what we So this is the application analysis and the staff report for this project. Um, this is a type of what community development office has Affect you action pursuant to Taker section 617.5 C16. Uh, DPW did have a comment uh, that they should remove note number one on the plan under the city of Clapper County for notes um, if there are not going to be any collaterals. And just say, 
it was on the, the checklist. Oh, subdivision review requirements. This is the subdivision checklist. Uh, this is so the subdivision checklist that was used at least in the past two years was actually adapted from the town's uh, subdivision review checklist. This checklist is written according to the city of Plattsburgh zoning code. Um, so this one, there was one section where uh, information about what was requested in the code. Uh, the code requests. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a, so you're talking about the model, not the sketch. What was the one that was supposed to be? Uh, it's the third it's one down from the first three. Two blind. Uh, okay. Number two, right, right there. Two. there second. Yeah, second. I actually marked it as media. I'm not sure if it's intended for you to a larger track that encompasses something that's two or, three or wider and, and you want everything within that. I'm not sure if that's what the intent was, uh, but even in the city of Plattsburgh, you get some of the older districts, you know, you've got lots that are 50 foot wide. Yeah. I'm including four lots in other direction. Right. I mean, our code is very outdated. That is a direct quote from the code okay. section 321 C, the, I'm sorry, B, the other spec plan review. But again, the, the planning board, and this is the waiver requirements section, where the planning board finds that the provision of certain requirements is, or the required improvements is not represent in the interest of the public health, safety, and general well, welfare, or is inappropriate because of inadequacy. The lack of connecting facilities adjacent or in proximity to the pro proposed subdivision, it may waive such requirements subject to appropriate conditions. Okay, maybe we could maybe we could just sum it up by saying that this proposed subdivision, um, the 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 plan identifies all affected parcels, um, in even though it doesn't meet the 200 feet, every parcel that's adjacent to the subdivision is identified within the plan. And on that basis, we we should be able to waive it. Back up to you guys. Yeah, I, I'm just adding for adding comment there. So I'd add to that, Rick. I, I believe that the sketch as as uh, shown, uh, you know, provides sufficient information to uh, meet that meet that second subdivision requirement. Um, I and I also I also for for this uh, subdivision don't believe that the contour requirement is 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 necessary. There is no new development. It's just it's a split merge. We're making an adjustment to a boundary line, and, and I agree. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I did mark it as okay. like that. Okay. Yeah. Requirements, but that is a the board. I agree with the waiver. Okay. I'm okay with that waiver. As you move up Hartwell Street, there's not a change in zoning. There's not a change in zoning as you move what would be north or south on Waterhouse. Um, so it's not as if. It's up against the land use site. Correct? No, there's actually a change in zoning right across the street. From our one or two. Is that what was that? Our one though. Yeah, Waterhouse Street is our one. And then you move across. across yeah. The yeah. But I, I don't find that impactful. Mm -hmm. It's a lot longer, okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't need to figure out that. Dean, just some clarification. Um, on the on the diagram, can you just describe to us the the paved surface on this slide? I I see pavement in front, which indicates to me that there may possibly be parking on in the front yard. Is that the only pavement? 
directly in front of the applicant's dwelling, correct? Yes. So will the will the new subdivision um, allow or permit for um, more pavement to remove the parking out of the front yard into an area beyond that? Or what is the intent of the subdivision? The intent is the fence that is along the existing boundary line will be relocated to the new boundary line. Okay. Um, there has been no discussion about an expansion of existing pavement that is there. Okay. Um, whether he does widen, um, I can't say. I I'll, I will ask the applicant. You know, okay. and we can show. You know. A, a potential uh, future parking area that is expanded where he may put one parking spot, for example, west of the existing pavement. Right. I can ask and inquire. And if that is the intent, then we can show. Okay. If there's going to be an expansion. Okay. So so Dean, uh, the uh, on your map, on your sketch map, where it looks like the fence returns to the existing house, your map shows that that that's basically all paved. The fence on the west property line, and then the little piece of fencing that returns back to the existing house. Is that correct? Go back to the area, please. You can sort of see it on the aerial photo. Right, so basically this part in, I'm sorry, this pavement area is in here. Okay. And basically, I mean, our, our field work, actually, yes, yes, you're right, it does. It does. You, you can't. And there, there, you is can't. Fence here. there is fence here that is shown on the plan, and this pavement comes up to that. I was going to say, your, your limits of pavement on the map are sort of uh, shielded by the, the fence line. But That's correct. It's, it's, it's it's there on the map. It just correct. The fencing sort of hides it. Yeah. It can be hatched to show its its current location. Okay. Yeah, just as with the intent of. Uh, creating a parcel that's more closely conforming in that same theme. I guess my question regarding the parking area, um, this, the city has regulation that doesn't allow front yard parking. Okay. If, if that could be moved out again, that would be a scenario of more closely conforming to our current zoning ordinance. Okay. So that, that was the nature of my of okay. my question could we could we create a more closely conforming relative to the lot width or relative to the relative parking? to location of parking okay. i mean as it as it sits now it's pre-existing and we can't make that change but if we could ask the uh as the applicant to consider the removal of front yard parking for parking beyond the front yard setback would be, or beyond the building line would be an appropriate question. Um, I've got, I uh, was looking on Google map today at um, the structure um, that we're talking about. And that piece that goes out to Hartwell street uh, at least from Google Map, that's a garage, isn't it? That's correct. Oh. Yeah, that, so there's a garage right in front there already, Rick. That's a garage that okay. you're looking at. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Sure, I wasn't sure. <laughs> I just assumed. But okay. yeah, so, so basically, um, there would be no other parking. Um, to be honest, I, I didn't remember now if it was, I think it was a two car garage. Well, I see the garage structure in the back, and I think that's what threw oh, me off. It, it, yeah, but that was all residents. Yeah. Um, no, there is, there is a garage. Um, 
Uh, yeah, in the back, I think it's just a cabana. At least that's what it looks like on Google Earth. But and the is, front it, it is, is a garage. garage. It is a garage. Okay. That, that makes total sense. Certainly are allowed to park in front of the garage. <laughs> Any other thoughts, questions? So, so Dean, in that, uh, on that back structure, you do have it labeled as existing garage. Do they, do they have access to that off of lot one? No. Because um, the, the fence dies into turns. the side of that garage. Yeah, uh, you're right, it does. Um, the, that, that garage, we had done some previous survey work out here. And um, the, fences, the fence that is there now replaced an older, an older fence. And I, their access to that garage was from within um, parcel uh, nine, the, the tax map parcel nine. Um, so he subsequent to the purchase and development of, of parcel nine, purchased lot one. There was there was snow on the ground. Um, we didn't see any physical access to that garage from lot one. Go back to your your aerial, Charisse. Yeah, I. Um, there was no there was no access from lot one. Um, with the addition of lot two to be merged with parcel tax map parcel nine, um, there could be an access over that 19 and a half foot strip that will be added and merged, but it won't be from lot one. Okay. Well, isn't my understanding um, is that the driveway at 43 Waterhouse driveway um, is adjacent to 43. Yeah, over there. Yeah, and it comes along and and you just go through the driveway and take a right and there's your garage. Mm -hmm. Am I misreading that? No, that's, that's correct. It's accurate. Yeah, and then for the house next to it, the, where we're going to be adding property, their garage is right in the front of the house. If you look at photo, you know, if you look at Google Earth and then it looks like the structure which yes, on the diagram, it says existing garage, but it looks like a cabana when you look on Google Earth. What is that building? Piece in the back, we're calling it a garage. It, it's, a, it's a shed, but it's large enough um, that it's used storage. I, I, I don't know exactly what he does inside other than it is a structure that's on tax map parcel nine and the axis is over tax map parcel nine and not off from lot one. Uh, I, I've got to believe that when with the approval of subdivision, the 19 and a half foot strip will then allow him more access. Uh, and that was a wall. There was a wall there in, in the south side of that, that shed garage is is his access and not and currently has no access off from the west side of that garage shed well i'm just asking i mean does that building behind the house on hartwell does it need to have vehicles going in or out of it because it looks like it's a shed. I mean, I don't. Right. There, there is no. There is no access for vehicles currently. Right. Yeah. Well, there's not supposed to be. It's just a shed. Right. And I, I would think. And, right. Correct. Okay. Uh, Dean, I think you you satisfied my question. Uh, yeah. 
I'm just looking if there was common access just by the fence, the way the fencing died into what's called the existing garage. Oh. So I, I'm, I think I'm good with the answer. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, Shalise, you have a resolution prepared. This is the standard template um, classifying the action as a type two action and approving the sketch plan. So, oh, Shalise, I can't see. I don't know if you're sharing. Oh, I'm the... sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's okay. So, I'll make the motion uh, resolution number 22 03, uh, recognizing this is a minor subdivision. Uh, that the board is looking at this as a sketch plan approval and also recognizing that it's a type two action with no further environmental review uh, being necessary. Second motion. Any further discussion? Uh, I, I also want to make the comment that the, the clarification of there being a garage uh, in front where the paved surfaces um, verifies my concern about parking in the front yard setback. Because that, I'm going to modify the map to show that 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 is that there is a structure there, a garage that is in part as part of the whole. Okay. House foundation. So we'll have to find a location here that that is a garage. Yeah. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. Can, can I add that in, um, oh, Jim? I, I was just going to say, and I'll, I'll recognize that discussion okay. slash condition into my motion. Okay. And Kurt, you dig with that as, <clears throat> as modified. Okay. Um, are you both satisfied with the language that's written in? I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, Shalise, can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Jim <laughs> Yes. Rick Perry? Yes. Rick Perry? Yes. Kurt Yep. Perfect. Thank you very much. On to the next application 22-04, Frontier Property Management Subdivision. Uh, this is the map as presented by the applicant. 
and it shows uh, average subdivision. Lot one will be the frontage along the bottom area. Lot two will have frontage along construction and uh, proportional along the area as well. Uh, just to make this what, what's proposed here a little clearer, I went through and highlighted a bit. The blue is the existing condition of the lot. Orange is the portion to be subdivided. And pink will be the remaining, remaining land after the closing. So the neighborhood is not closed. Uh, this is a view of the street from Rinca. I'm sorry, a view of the existing improvements from Rinca Hall. Um, it is the former Merchants National Bank. And this is a view from Marion uh, looking south to east. Sorry, looking southeast as a uh, sort of building. Um, right now, the wall is empty, but this is the location of the Jane Arthur mural. Um, there was no zoning pack provided for this application, uh, so I don't have that. But in the staff report, Um, so the staff report, we have identified that a variance is necessary for lot one. Um, it's going to have a depth of 98 feet where 100 feet is required by the code. Uh, lot two will also be deficient with an average depth of 85.5 feet. However, this will be uh, negated by the merger within two neighboring parcels upon the merger. Um, Back On the murder, I think the depth will be greater than 122 feet, but I'm not 100% certain that connection with this neighboring lot 21. But it will also be a seat for starting this um, I have confirmed with the building inspector's office that the variance will not be necessary as long as a condition of pleasure is on the And that is all I have. Essentially, um, the uh, bank building um, is intended to come up and be included in lot one. Uh, and lot two will be the remaining lands that will be merged. It was always the intent of the applicant to merge that with two additional parcels that he has in Protection Avenue. Earlier uh, this evening, in your, in your work session, you're talking about you know, whether this is going to be a building lot. It is not. Uh, the applicant has other properties along Protection and along Margaret Street. And this parking um, lot, this parking area, uh, is an area that he needs for those businesses and for those uh, the other property he has um, in the immediate area. Also, Lot 1 uh, currently uh, has uh, parking stalls that are also within the same parking lot. There will be a, uh, an agreement, an easement that will go with the property where they have that designated, designated park installs. So it will be maintained as a parking lot. That would make clear to you by the applicant that he needs these park installs for his business, business or businesses, and um, other rentals that he has in that immediate area. The, the point being, um, with respect to being a building lot, it has the capability of housing a building in could at any time. Um, I'm going, I'm looking at the way our, our agenda is written, where it says in here, and I don't know where the language came from, surely, so, um, where uh, approximately 1.2 acre lot with existing improvements to be sold, not to be retained, but 
for the purpose of sale, it sounds more. like. Yep, a lot more. So that being the case, mm -hmm. um, no longer being within the same ownership and potentially having the same parking agreement, mm -hmm. is that going to is that going to vary the fact that it's going to be sold off? That or, any sale, any sale to another entity will have that agreement as part of that sale. It won't. Um, I'm not sure as far as any change. Um, there, there will be no change relative to what's physically being used uh, by the building now, currently for park installed. So, however many that there are, that will be made part of the agreement in the sale of lot one. Okay. So, so eventually, sale of lot one. If I'm hearing you correctly, the change of ownership will not change the status of of parking. It'll be part of part of the deed it will be correct. written into the deed that's correct so if we make a motion that says parking spaces for lot one will be um added to the deed for lot two that would be acceptable correct and that was even part of the applicant's understanding and he brought that forward that because currently there are parking stalls in that parking lot on lot two that are designated for the use of that building. Long okay. better, not more. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I think there was even discussion about providing a draft description um, to, to show that that is um, the proposed deed that includes Parker Saul's in that conveyance. Okay. Okay. Dean, Dean, when you read, when you return to the board, Dean, you don't have any objection bringing, uh, bringing forward, like you say, that draft language. I know in past applications, we've actually had that draft language reviewed at the, you know, the city attorneys reviewed it. That's fine. We'll, at that time, we'll have some detailed information about the lot size and more detailed businesses. And then can also include that uh, as part of the, uh, the draft description for today. Does does any does any of the other adjacent properties have deeded deeded right to this property that we're changing and merging? Um, I'm not 100 percent sure, but that is something that I will be looking at. Okay, that would be a question. And my other question: the uh, parcel. The, the old bank that is to you know to be for sale uh any of its uh any of its access points you know whether it be for emergency exiting or for for you know accessing the building are those off of the parking lot that's correct so so those would be oh. other other parts of the deeded rights to for access to that building um I, you know, that's something that I'm going to, have to look at uh, a little more closely as far as their access points. Um, you can go back to one of the, the photos where the mural is now. I don't think there's anything in there that shows any kind of access point on the north side of the building. Okay. But, that, but that's something that we look at in more detail before we come back uh, with a submission to the board. Okay. There is one there. There is one there. Yeah. And then, yeah, to, fur to further that, the this the bank's building actually connects to uh, Wu's building, it looks like. Yeah. So, yeah, once again, there's got to be a, a number of deeded, well, potentially deeded rights, uh, you know, between adjacent properties. Potentially. But no, definitely. Um, once we get into the detailed work, then we'll look at those uh, deep current deeds, the record to determine just 
who has what for easements or whether there are any easements that exist. I, I guess with, with that said also, I didn't, uh, at least I didn't see if DPW or the electric department had any, any utility comments. Uh, DPW declined to comment if they do it as premature at the sketch plan review. Um, okay. They will provide that in the detailed review, but as of right now, they don't feel that it has the information they need to review it. Okay. So, Dean, I, I'm assuming that's going to be part of your research for that resubmission, you know, where utilities are, that, that type of thing. Correct. Okay. Any other comments, questions? So it seems like on this one, we, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure it's difficult to know here, but we don't have the structures right on our map and, and we don't have structures within 200 feet, which may be the example. Correct. It'll be the same scenario where I'm serving half of the block on north of protection and in the same thing to the east of the subject property or even to the to the south. Nothing across the area to the north. No west, sorry. Is a church. Yeah. So I guess it would be the same question, even though it's not checked off in the subdivision checklist, where it's not it's not requested, but there is a line item in the uh, staff review, uh, item number three A. And again, it, it you know it, it's a matter of. Is that information that is really needed for this particular subdivision right here? I guess I just want to decide now so that you right. have to do what we're going to space. Right. Is that 200 feet? Is that... So, so I'd, I'd elaborate similar to what I what I had uh, discussed in the in the prior application. Um, I'm 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 not sure that. Uh, the 200 feet requirement is is necessary in this application. Um, same thing with the contours, but but clearly there is a lot of information still to grab within this sketch survey uh, to define some of the questions. You know, some of the right of ways. You know, in relationship to the buildings, sidewalks. You know, curb line along Protection Avenue. You know, what's on property, what's not. I mean, that that. That should surely be defined within the within the final subdivision. Correct. No, I agree, and that's something that you know we will, you know, continue to gather and, and map um, before the next submission. Besides, we still have a step to take before we even get to that point, going to the zoning board when we are parents. I would, I would also suggest that the, the lots within this block that front Margaret Street, that there are parcels that are owned by the applicant, um, that he will be um, utilizing this parking lot to service those lots. So I, I would think that at least the block should be identified um, because they are impacted by the parking location that he's providing. By how much detail? Um, no, just notation that. Okay. He owns this. He owns that. And then yes. That. Yeah. that way we can we can assess the parking okay. for that particular building. Okay. On that lot. Okay. And Dean to and Dean to further that you know clarity of deeded rights. <laughs> which you, yeah, which you're gonna want anyway, but. You know, what whatever properties on Margaret are are affected by the you know the deeded rights of this this uh, this division. I'm kind of curious in your research. 
Um, not many people know know that Gold Street exists. Were you surprised? No, because I, I was <laughs> in there. With... I was in there when it was Bob Seven years ago, in the 80s. <laughs> and um, but no, I I've done work in that area. <laughs> So I'm curious to know if the, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever parked in this lot, right? I'm curious to know if it's restricted parking only to customers or renters of, it friends, is. of the owner. It is correct. It is It is gated. It is gated. There, gated. there is a, there was a sliding gate and there, there's, there's curbing that's along protection and then coming down a uh, short distance on Marion Street. So there is a gated access. Uh, for that parking okay. lot. Do you know if any of that will change and if, if the owner is planning improvements to the lot? Um, he hasn't expressed any changes. Um, the only change would be a, a paper line yeah. uh, to show the new boundary line. Okay. Um, but no, there were no, no proposed changes being made to the site that I've been made aware of at this time. Yeah, my my only negative comment regarding the the application is similar to Jim's that when you have a required means of egress out of the bank property off Brinker off Street okay. that goes over a property line, um, I think that needs a little bit more protection. So that proposed language should should also explore how that exit's going to be treated. Okay. Sir, I have a question. I guess Jim or Rick or Shalise, I don't know. If the you know common parking lot improvements that would come along at some point could be lighting, or fencing, um, and I understand this is to, to be maintained as a parking lot. If those improvements come later, would those have to come back before the board or because it's existing land use to, to, to the same land use? They may be, um, and this is just my opinion, but they may be allowed site improvements without necessarily having to come before the board. There are considerations of, you know, light reflection as to yeah, how it impacts the Clinton Street because yeah. these are the residents on Protection Avenue that front Clinton Street right. and back Protection. Yeah, exactly what I was wondering about. Yeah. If those improvements are somewhere in the vision for this site, as long as the owners, the property owners, come in back before the board for review if those should be included but if they're nowhere in the vision or would need approval later then that's okay, okay. at yeah. this point i don't believe that there was anything being proposed um other than just a uh a new parcel boundary line okay. um, but uh, I'll, i i will ask for clarification okay. yeah the other the other part of my answer uh kurt is um I think the discretion of the building inspector at the time of application would, would be where we could, uh, where we may become re-engaged in that, in this uh, request. Is there anyone willing to make a motion? Shalise, can you share your sketch resolution? Yes, I can. Perfect. Thank you. This 
So I'll make a motion to move forward resolution number 22-04, uh, which is a minor subdivision sketch plan review approval, um, recognizing the action as an unlisted action under seeker um, with uh, discussion slash conditions. Uh, I guess not number one that the that the application uh, will present further mapping of buildings, utilities, right of ways uh, as necessary to define the property. Number two, uh, all deeded rights. to the property being subdivided and merged to be defined. Be defined uh, by draft description to the planning board? That, that, that's fine. And, and, to be, and to be reviewed by the city attorney. Tim, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I ask a question? Uh, the last application we had where we did this was VA clinic, and there was a requirement that there be a note on the final plat of the filing number of any easements. Are you seeking that here too or no? Um, I think that's appropriate. I mean, once again, we don't necessarily have all the information to define it at this moment. So... They don't, yeah, because the, um, the sequence of, of recording. Um, I mean, deed, because we don't know when the deed is going to actually take place. It may not be for another year and a half. It could be two months from now. But the map, once it's completed, um, will be required beyond file within 60 days, two days. I think uh, Dean, as long as you're as long as you're uh, you're comfortable, I, I'd reserve that as potential conditions in the final subdivision approval, okay. if that's acceptable. You know, once we have a little more information on your you know your final map. Okay. And then number three, I, I would uh, uh, also add that the the applicant uh, uh, provide due diligence and research on all uh, egress rights. Um, or access rights uh, to any of the adjacent uh, properties <laughs> slash buildings and reflect and reflect those rights on the final subdivision plan. That relate to the parking lot parcels. Um, I, I would, uh, Dean, I would, well. Because that's your cover, because there, there could be other easements that are, um, that are in those deeds that are affecting Gold Street or something else, but has nothing to do with with the parking lot parcel. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let Dean, let's let's see what you come up with in your final research. I mean, my, the 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 point of my item number three is to make sure you know, for instance, the bank that has a clear exit that that's 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 reflected in your subdivision plan somehow, whether it's an easement or a right. Uh, for that building, you know, if you see what you come up with in your in your final subdivision research. Okay. And I believe that I believe that uh, completes my motion. We have a second. I'll second that. Thank you. Any further discussion. Shalise, can we have a roll call, please? Jim Arbella? Yes. Rick Perry? Yes. Reg Carter? Yes. Kurt Gurwich? Yes. Greta Reedman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, Dean. <laughs> okay. Before we get on to other business, does anyone need to take a break?
No breaks needed. Let's move on. Already took off. We need to take it to We need to get out of the room. They haven't asked us to do that, so I'm going to hang out with you. Okay. So just going to bust into the windows. <laughs> 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 I don't think we're going to have to finish something up in the oh, okay. bathroom first. Yeah. Okay. We need to get fresh. Yeah. Um, do you have any status updates? Um, not a whole lot. Um. I mean, the biggest one is uh, two new members. So, welcome again, Abby and Tom. Um, do you guys want to take a minute and go, like, go over your background or meet some? That's the chat group. Three and a half hours. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Um, yep. Abby User Curve. Um, I just moved here this summer with my family. Um, my husband works at uh, CBH, and then we have two kids. Our son is three, my daughter is six, and she goes to Bailey out. Um, my husband's family's from Loudville, so just kind of my Watertown area. So I'm Canadian, but uh, I'm well, I'm a dual citizen, but um, moved to the US in 2005. And then I've been in Illinois, um, then Minnesota, and now New York State. Um, so we're here now. Um, background is in architecture, and sustainability is my specialty. So I work remotely with an architecture from based in Minneapolis right now, um, which I've been doing since 2018. Uh, uh, yeah, we're settled here and looking to get involved uh, in the community here. Blackbird just seems like a really, it's, it's close to Canada, I think that's so cool. <laughs> just, I mean, it just seems really like a lot, the people are super friendly, kind of rural, but also like got some urban mindset, which is really cool. So I'm excited. They're pretty nice label there. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I thank everyone for this has been an amazing kind of first experience that I've done here. Um, <laughs> baptism by fire. Pardon me. <laughs> baptism by fire. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think it is a beautiful example of like we were talking about, you know, debate and disagreement, but yeah. kind of consensus and resolution. It's very. It's really exciting to kind of see local government in action with some of that. Uh, I'm Tom Cosgrove. Uh, I uh, grew up here originally, went to high school at St. Catholic, moved away uh, during college, and in my post secondary career as well, went to school at City Buffalo. Uh, originally, was an architecture major. I only lasted one semester. Um, I switched over to civil and structural engineering. I did three summers with the, uh, the DOT here in Plattsburgh, so the bridge over uh, the highway on the Tom Miller Road and uh, the bridge on Bear Swamp Road down in Peru. Uh, probably had a few mistakes in life from when I was a young man. Um, after uh, undergraduate, I went to Carnegie Mellon for sustainability, environmental, and civil engineering, uh, as well as focus on energy efficiency and existing buildings. So I also uh, moved back here in about 2019. Uh, my wife is a professor of college. We have an almost three-year-old, uh, and uh, so I work remotely for a large energy efficiency consulting firm that's based in Austin, Texas, but most of my work is in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania or in the greater Boston area. So I sort of supervise a team of engineers in each of those areas. So, uh, yeah, just really fortunate to be able to be back home where both uh, my parents and my wife's parents are and, and be on a uh, beautiful area to be able to get. So, yeah, and same, same reason, um, you know, uh, I'm going to get involved more in the city, get back a little bit. It's been a tough couple of years to do too much of that. And so, yeah. Did you have a city firefighter? My uncle is a city firefighter, and uh, my dad is a uh, insurance adjuster. His, his father uh, did work for the city for a long time. I, I yeah. was working there when my grandfather yep. <laughs> was city adjuster. Yep. yep. And, uh, and yeah, then my dad was a, a firefighter for South Potsdam as well. Okay. My uncle Tim was a um, city cop for a little while too. So, yeah, lots, lots of cosmos in and out of 
I would like personally like to have more unit discussion here. Um, there, there are a lot of uh, to include D by the way, um, because there there's a lot that's left to interpretation that um, we can all look at it differently, which I which I think we we do to a certain degree. Um, it, and just clarification on direction. Um, very informative uh, session. I wasn't here, but I did get to see most of it um, on YouTube. So I'd like to hear a lot more. I do also want to apologize. I'm not sure what happened that day with Zoom. Uh, my understanding, I know that my Zoom crashed at the very end of the meeting for those who were there at the end. Uh, but prior to that, apparently the Zoom cut off after about an hour. Um, yeah, so uh, most of the meetings, and especially the most important discussions that's were at the end of the meeting, didn't actually be captured in the recording. So I apologize. I'm not sure that. I had to jump off before the really important meeting, more where the, where the discussion started, I think, that everybody talk about it being so valuable. So I don't know what occurred in that session, um, but it sounds like there's a desire to dig into whatever that discussion was about more with them. Yeah. So, so, and I really go over the details of that now, but it does seem like there's interest in having them back for more thorough discussion of whatever happened at the end. My key takeaway, and I'm going to refer to both Brad and Jim and flare up too if you want to. Um, my key takeaway was that you guys wanted to hear more about the historic districts, specifically the downtown region, registered and maybe redefining within our zoning code how we address historic sites and districts. That was my key takeaway, but I would admit that I did not take my time performing very well at that moment. So, social lease based on the presentation that we saw, you know, the first presentation from Arch and the discussion that uh, the professional had um, in regards to our local ordinance. Um, I, that, that's really a, what, what interests me in terms of focus on a future presentation. Um, you know, she elaborated on some very unique definitions and unique things about our historic districts. Uh, that are different from even on, uh, you know, she serves on her own board, I believe she indicated down in the central uh, New York area. Um, I would love for her to expand on, you know, what is unique about our ordinance? What is uh, uh, problematic um, or, or too narrowly focused? Um, you know, she even uh, started to discuss, uh, you know, how interesting it is that we have purely residential historic districts 
um, which is and and centrally focused around that, where many other communities have a centrally focused commercial historic district, which may span out into residential districts. Um, you know, we have a downtown that's fully potential for historic designation. In fact, any any funding that occurs downtown state or federal wise, you have to go through a historic review for it. But we locally don't recognize that at all. I, I, once again, I'd love for her to expand on that whole discussion. Um, pros and cons, uh, especially seeing we're in the middle of a comp plan in the middle of rezoning potentially. I, it, it, that, that really would be a good focus, I think. I just want to follow up on what Jim just said, um, because, yeah, the um, you know, when she said we're the only city our size in the state of New York where the downtown is not a designated historical district, which makes us um, ineligible for all kinds of grants and funding and tax breaks and. So I would I would be really interested in in hearing about more information about that. And yes, as part of our uh, comprehensive plan, you know, what would it look like if that was a part of the plan to pursue? And the other thing that she mentioned that I found really interesting was um, how many um, cities our size have a separate um, entity that is in charge of all historical um, sites and responsible for them. And because she said there, you know, there's a lot of, there's overlap, but she, I mean, she talked about it, that having a separate uh, body of, uh, you know, volunteer uh, public servants who would, be responsible for, um, you know, making decisions like, you know, the, the first two decisions that we voted on tonight, they would be the entities that would, would be doing all of that historical review and working with um, Seeker. And they would also be able to um, help people who live in historic districts access um, funding that is available to them that you know just sits untapped because we simply don't have the resources. Um, I know I talked to Milena when she was the planner, and she said, "Yeah, there's HUD money, there's, but for any one project, it's a time-consuming process on the part of you know whoever at the city level is working on it, and we just don't have any such thing." So. It just made it sound like there's a lot out there that we could be accessing to really help us in our downtown and really help us in terms of incentivizing um, the preservation of our historical areas. Because, you know, if we can offer people tax breaks, if we can help them find grants, help them find funding, you know, all of a sudden, like for like is not a cost prohibitive endeavor. You know, it becomes something that's totally doable. But if people don't know that it's available and don't have someone to help them through the process, that's money that's that we're missing out on. So those two particular things I found really interesting. I'd love to hear more about how we could get on board with, um, you know, making the most of what's out there to help us. Please, after the meeting, you put out an email. Yes. And I responded with what I thought was clarification. And I think everybody got a copy of that. Yes. And basically what we had talked about was asking our next step to summarize in maybe four or five minutes what they thought were key opportunities and or issues facing the city from their perspective. And the thought was that might give us some focus in terms of priority and how we can best move forward. I think somehow we have to find a way to, you know, narrow down really what we want to focus on if we want to move this thing forward. And I think both the items, uh, you know, that Jim and uh, Loretta just mentioned would be included as, you know, four or five items, you know, for our discussion and 
more consideration of what the process would be in order to start getting some action. Hey, Brad, Brad. So I'm going to reach out to Aaron um, and Christine from our team to go through this list of what you guys have identified. I can ask them who they're excited about what they identify as well. Um, then we can go from there, I guess. See what they say, move forward from there. So this was any of that recorded that we would be able to I mean, I'm be able to watch it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll send you guys the link. I we have a recording. Um unfortunately it cut off after about an yeah, hour. Okay. Probably yeah. about two hours. Yeah. So unfortunately, I think the best content got cut off. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> but I can definitely send you guys something with that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, that's all I have for ARCH uh, bylaws. So you guys should all have a copy of the bylaws in front of you. If not, I can pull it up on the screen. So Abby and Tom, this is something that the board has been working on possibly, did you guys say a year, two years? Two years. Two years. Um, kind of trying to identify some bylaws and individual updates just to, to guide the board on how to act, how to, how to handle applications and for applicants to understand our expectations as well. Um, we've gone through a lot of iterations and I think we had a meeting sometime in, I want to say January, maybe it might have been early February, um, with the Corporation Council, the legal advice meeting to guide the board on this. Uh, there's a few updates noted and language that wanted to be clarified at the time. Uh, Dean has gone through and provided that update of uh, that language, and this is the version after those updates. Um, and we just are looking tonight to get a kind of final consensus so we can move forward and make some decisions. Yeah, I I I didn't know that. No change in some sense. Nothing since okay. the did it. Yeah, so that was the last update. Did you guys uh I did email it out? I'm sorry, I added a comment before you guys were pointed out email it out to everyone uh asking if there were any, you know, to do in a final review and ask if there were any questions or concerns about it. Yeah, the final. It was, yeah. So, Chalice. I'm not sharing my screen, am I? No, that's okay. I, my, my question was more general. Um, I'm, I, I mean, this has been on our, on our, our thoughts and discussions for at least a couple of years now. Um, I'm assuming seeing you were able to, you know, finalize comments and get, you know, get an updated draft version uh, to us earlier last week. Um, and now that we have, uh, you know, two new members, uh, um, I, I would, I would love to see that, you know, maybe we have one more month just to review through this draft and, and you know, at, at next meeting have any, any final comments and, or maybe there's no comments, no more discussion, and you know the next meeting, you know the the board can decide what uh, what motion they'd like to make. Okay. If that's. I was worried about the window for a second. So I think he's suggesting that we take this and read this, and at the next meeting. So I know that they were the goal was to get this moving to capital uh, and have a decision tonight. So that the meeting could take progress and get that moving to council uh, for a March approval of council. Can I ask when did our new alternate members receive this? Uh, the day after the new alternate members, or last Friday? Last Friday. 29th. No, no, I mean the next. Yeah. yeah. So what's it, I, Shalise, I couldn't hear you. So there's some type of, we're looking to get this to the common council at some type of date. Yeah, they, uh, I think your goal was to have this done tonight uh, because again, it's really just cleaning up the language that you guys have reviewed at the last meeting, um, being able to clean that up. And then it was just to get you guys to kind of, okay, those changes uh, essentially, nothing substantive really change. And then 
get it moving the council uh, for a March approval. Uh, yeah, I, I'm on. Um, I had two quick comment or uh, uh, thoughts, Shalise, in the training. Um, I was wondering if it would be appropriate to put how much training per year um, is required for uh, members of the board. We have failure by any member of the planning board to meet the mandated annual tra training requirements. Can we put in there what the mandated training yeah. requirements are just for clarification? I think the goal was to leave that language a little vague, uh, especially whenever it's around a code or a statute or regulation or guidance from another state or agency. And that's specifically because that might change from time to time and we don't want to have uh, okay. a new local law every time an update needs to be made to this. Okay. The other one um, that the special meetings, when those are called, do those, wait a second, all members of the board shall be notified, but does, I can't remember, do um, special meetings have to be open to the public? Yes. Does and that have to be posted ahead of time to the public? As soon as practically, as, I think the language is something along the lines of as soon as practicable. Um, okay, so should we include that language in there? The language is already, you know, up above for the regular meetings. Would the same language be included for the special meetings? I can put in a comment here to ask me. Uh, okay. Is it the same as zoning, Shalise? Same as zoning? I would zoning is advertising has to be three consecutive days, five to 10 days prior to the meeting. No. It's, so it's different. No, it's it must be within. Sorry, I have to double check the code, but it's. I want to say it's no later than three days prior to the meeting or five days, seventy-two hours. It's something about open meeting clause, and the code has a specific requirement. It's between three and five days. No sooner and no later than three and five days. Um, but I mean, the guidance and the guidelines are already open meeting clause. And well, I mean, I would imagine it's the same as for regular meetings, but again, um, it it seems like that language should be in there for special meetings. That's all I have. Anybody else? So I, I mean, I love. I'm not really concerned about like the urgency of getting this to the council mm. immediately. And we have two new alternate members who had a short time to review it. Um, and I still am a, like a, I'm still a little troubled by the alternate by section six, the alternate planning board member section. So I would be for moving this as an agenda item, you know, when when we're not at 9:30. And we don't know when that is, right? Because the next meeting may have a full agenda also. Okay. But um I guess specifically the point that I'm concerned about, and maybe I don't know, I can be talked out of this, I guess, but the the point that one point one item that I have issue with is in paragraph two of section six, in the event that a regular planning board member is absent for the initial hearing, an alternate member is not last served or replaced. Makes sense. And then the regular planning board member resumes sitting. I think if we're moving our alternates to sit on an item and they're there at the initial hearing, that they would retain sitting on that item. I think it's difficult to keep alternate members if if our alternates don't often have a voice on the board. 
and you may sit for two months or three months without a recusal or without some kind of conflict of interest. And that's typical. You guys, how would you guys like to work off this? Do you want me to send the comments to Dean and ask him to review and then circulate again to you guys? Or do you want to set up a special meeting like we had with him before, virtual council? Or do you want to wait until the March meeting? So, so Shalise, to, to, you know, going back to what I uh, stated before, I think uh, I agree with Kurt. You know, we do have two brand new alternates who have just come onto the board. They've had less than a week, maybe, to, to review this and, you know, maybe give them the opportunity to, to review. And if they have, com if people have comments, and same thing with, the, you know, the regular board members. You know, we've got one or two comments just in five minutes after I, <laughs> I said maybe we wait a month. Uh, so, um, you know, if we can uh, all collectively take a look at this over the next month, try to make sure we've got any final comments we have for March. Uh, Shalise, I think it would be helpful maybe if Dean is available, uh, you know, so that in March we have our comments. Dean's there. If it's something that uh, can be easily addressed, then we can move this move this thing forward. As far as Kurt's comment about the alternate members, you know, I I tend to to agree to a certain extent that you know if an alternate member in, in most cases most alternate uh, alternate serving on the board ends up being most of the time a refer you know uh, a, a recusal condition so they continue many times through the application. I guess there is maybe a potential for someone not to be here and an alternate serves and, you know, it, it would seem to me that they would continue serving on that application. Although it's, I don't know if there's any law or anything that, you know, requires the board to act on that a certain way, you know, when the, when the full-time member returns to the board. So the, the Dean definitely should, should maybe can offer comment on that. And then, Another item that I think we need clarification on is who votes on these bylaws, right? Because I'm not comfortable with the we're a seven member board now. And when we vote on these bylaws, do we do that as a seven member board or as five voting members? Which to me is strange that that would be five voting members voting about the voice of two other members on the board who don't have. The same ability to vote. That seems strange to me, so I want to clarify. So it's actually the council that votes on the bylaws. Uh, the council is, would be passing it via a local law. We so right it. now it's something that you guys are deciding to refer to the council. Um, if you're asking about who votes to refer, I think I don't feel comfortable speaking legally to that, but I would say that. My understanding of past president and past guidance from specifically Mark Schaffner would be that only voting members would be alternates are only appointed to make a vote on a specific application when needed under state law. So they technically would not be able to vote on administrative procedures or anything like that because they're not appointed to. Vote. So, but that's I'm not an attorney and that is not. I'm not sure. So, so Shalise, in this in this regard, we as a board don't even have to vote per se uh, for approval of these. Uh, we need to come to a collective agreement of our recommendations for the Common Council, yes. which would allow all seven members to to recommend and you know put that within the recommendation to the Common Council. Yes, the and recommendations the council would be open to. Do whatever they're going to do with this with main developer issues. Sure. That makes sense to me, Jim, also. So I think we just want to be clear that we want a seven person consensus. Yeah. On moving. Yep. On yep. All inclusive. Yeah. yeah. Or 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 if we don't have consensus, that all all comments are included and forwarded on. Yeah. You know. I I mean that's but I, but I think yeah, ultimately we're, we're pretty close, so. And is there, are there any other comments you want me to send on to me from the review before the next meeting? 
You have one word that is a question for me. Yeah. Some planning board bylaws I know have specific language about alternates breaking copies, right? That if there's four regular members present, that an alternate can break a tie. I would like to see tie breaking language because we had a tie weeks ago, right? That put us in a predicament where an application took longer, I think, than it should have. I think Dean addressed this in the meeting the last Oh, week. maybe I'm forgetting. Okay. Uh, because uh, my understanding is, first of all, the five member board, the only reason we had a tie was because we had an absence and we had no alternates at the time. But an alternate, mm -hmm. when they served as members, they are serving as a member. So, yes, they, they get rid of tie. And so, in that case, here's my question. Does the applicant have the ability to say, I'd like to table this to the next meeting? Yes. Or does our ability to bring in an alternate trump their ability to table? The they can table it. The applicant only always, always has the discretion to go to vote if they don't have a full member. Right. But, but, but an alternate counts as a full member. And you are yes. five, yeah, five voting members. And that includes they don't use the language all together with false by voting members of the board. So the challenge I have there is that if if there are four members, yeah, and we say let's bring in oh, so we an alternate should be sitting on this item. That's automatic. It should be automatic if they're present. If they right. refuse a yeah. five member board. If there's a you always have the entitlement of a five member voting board. Yep. The issue was we only had four people. I, 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 there's I, nobody else. Right, no, I, I get that. I, I, I get that, but I'm curious to know if that night with the four member board had an alternate been sitting, they automatically would have been placed. They would have been a yeah. voting member. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The only thing I would qualify that on is that the alternate member has to be willing and, and has to have done the due diligence to yeah. review the prior record and, and, and commit to that, you know, in the prior to serving in the middle of an application. Yeah, I mean, we have that language somewhere in here. If not in here, it's definitely in our going code, but uh, we have that language that the applicant, or sorry, that any board member who is absent must announce that they have reviewed the minutes or materials of the meeting, et cetera, uh, when they're sitting. So, actually, that language is for if, like, if I'm not at next month's board meeting because you know i'm on vacation and an alternate sits in for me the language that we have right now is that i would come back and confirm that i had reviewed everything that happened at the meeting that i missed and then resume my place on the board um but now we're going to look at the possibility that if you know if i'm on vacation all matters that come to the board for the meeting that I miss, all new applications will then the the app the alternate who took my place will see those through, um, and so that I realize is to be discussed. But that's where that language came from that you have to review everything. I think that for alternates, we should just have some language, regardless of where it is, just that. Um, you know the all you know the alternate has to be at meetings so that an alternate can fill in for an absent voting member and if necessary vote so i don't know if it, i mean that's kind of assumed but if we want to have language about that i guess we could but that was just kind of you know that's what i was told when i came on the board yeah you have to be there because if someone isn't there, you have to be able to vote on something that you've been you've been listening to the discussion, and you're familiar with the the application. Isn't that covered under general expectations? Because if a alternate board member replaces a board member, they automatically move from alternate to board member, and the general expectations outline responsibility taking on that role as a board member. And that includes familiarity with the application being discussed and voted upon. So I think technically it's covered. I mean, yeah, there's a 
section two to like this point here. Planning board members will be prepared for discussion. Read all the excuse me, read all the meeting materials in advance and contact CDO staff if they have any questions about the material they have provided. All planning board members will attend all meetings and provide their location in advance. But, I mean, I think it's implied. I think, yeah, so it's covered. If Even if you're an alternate, you're still a planning board member. So the expectations are the same for everyone, correct? Yes. Anything else, So, so Shalise, I guess within our, within our, uh, I think the clarity is there, either the understanding of it is there, whether you're an alternate or you're, you know, you're a active, you know, a voting member. You know, if you come in the middle of an application, whichever you're deemed coming into the coming into it, uh, you know, you need to be prepared with uh, the past history of the application. Um, one clarification, I, I know that in past board actions, uh, there has been uh, has been recommended that that member, when they see, make that specific statement, you know, that they have familiarized with themselves with the past history of the application, and they are prepared to consider uh, the past information and any new information, and in, you know, in the consideration of the application. So, you know. Want to take this statement and put it somewhere else as well? Um, it, once again, it, it, to, to Loretta's point and to others, you know, that sort of fits in underneath alternate. I, th I think that that just fits in for any member that's going to sit and act on an application, you know, whether they come in as an alternate, whether they come in as a, you know, we're a voting member that missed last month and are coming into it. I mean, well, are we doing that or are we having a alternate? serve continuously after they I, I, I guess some of that's going to be addressed by Dean's response to Kurt's question you know and and once again within uh, I would say state regulations you know what what what's supposed to happen when a voting member returns I, I can say with confidence that there's no guidance in the state regulations that offers what to do when a voting member um, well, the guidance in there about what to do when somebody's absent, but it kind of leaves off there. If, if, if that be the case, then then Kurt's question is a very valid question because you know what I mean. It may, you know, what 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 we do should be defined in our bylaws. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to be here next month. I, I had mentioned that, so. Yeah. And, and exercise some of this conversation, but when it when it comes time for the group discussion, my agreement is with Kurt that if a alternate replaces a planning board member that's not present, myself, case in point, then I should not be sitting back when I return. They've been here, you know, without laps or hesitation and they should continue once i moved away the one seat they assume yeah. the response. if it's the initial period if you sat for you know somebody comes back three four times sometimes and you sat for three of them then this is the fourth and come and you're there for the fifth i think yeah. you come back to sit once you're updated on but if, you, if an alternate here is the initial they should remain sitting right so you think there would be around Specifically at the start of the new process, yeah, rather yes. than as you described, missing maybe multiple meetings in a row, even if you've had some familiarity with it. The only ideally, in, in, in the spirit of fairness, we want continuity, yeah, right, regardless yeah. of whether the member started that project as an alternate or disappointed or as a permanent member of the Yes. I guess as someone who was newly appointed as uh, an alternate to this, uh, how common are absences within the board? Because maybe may be a, may a non-issue if 
it's if most matters are resolved within one or two hearings and absences are infrequent, you may be writing yourself into a corner for a situation that's not very likely or may have just happened very recently and then be you know very front of mind for that reason. I think the accused is about planning and absence. Yeah. Yeah. We to be fair, we have we've had very few absences in the past two years because the governor has suspended certain portions of the meetings law. Sure. So we have had the opportunity to engage remotely via Zoom right. far more than mm -hmm. we were able to in the past. Yes. Open meetings law does allow for teleconferencing, video conferencing, I'm sorry, not teleconferencing, video conferencing video. Um, in general as well. Yeah. However, the requirements under regular open meetings law is that the location of every person attending, but you know, as a participant in the meeting yeah. um, on the board, not necessarily the people attending, but um, their location must be published and advertised, and you must allow anybody to attend from that location. So, if we're in the vacation in Florida, we have to publish this Florida vacation home address. And if somebody wants to fly down there and go to the house, they are technically allowed to be sure. Sure. Um, so that that portion has been suspended, which has made it easier for people to attend remotely. Sure, they are traveling. Um, so pre-COVID, I think we had more absences than we had in the past year. Sure. sure. But as far as calling upon alternates, I'm guessing that recusals are more frequent occurrence than absence. I agree. Carry all the way through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'd also say, you know, in 12 years or 11 years on the board, it all happens. Like every combination of weird scenario of sure things happen, right? So not that we have to game all those out, but those that seem to happen frequently have or, or have the potential to have large impacts on decisions. So I, I have a question. Yeah, because, absolutely. So the section on alternate members, it, it talks about when you're voting and kind of the react of the receptive kind of role. It's not as clear to me like in the section on committees where it talks about the chairperson can appoint committees, if there's special things. What is the alternate member's role and kind of uh kind of a voice uh in terms of proactive things or other aspects of the group? That's a great question. Kurt, can you remind me, were you an alternate when you were appointed to the PAC? Yeah, so, uh, yes. And yes. So typically when it comes to proactive things like serving on the, you know, the comprehensive planning committee, which is a community-wide committee, but we have representation there and other things like that, or we decide to create a committee to look into historic review guidelines. Then our, my experience on the board, tell me, Jim, you've been here a long time too, and you has been that we consider ourselves as seven members for that and an alternate that's interested in serving in those committees. Yeah, committee appointments seem to be the whole board. Um, it seems to be more like when it's a, a decision of the board that requires a five minute vote, that's when. Yeah, it's a formal application. So, so, it, so, would those maybe more clarification? Yeah, that we would want to include in. Anywhere. If this is meant as a tool to kind of introduce a more into as well as, a, as an ultimate measure. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's a yeah. thing to talk about or if that's. Yeah, so I'm it's kind of like the things that are understood. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, not... yeah. Right, right. I was a part of appointed to the comp plan committee as an alternate. I believe so. Yeah, because yeah, that, that, that was ongoing. Yeah, yes. Did that start sure. with Tom? Did that start with Tom? Yeah, that was 2020. So, yeah, that yeah. was. I just got very interesting. So that'll be included. Is that the thought?
Yes. Easy. Hey, uh, Shalise. Yes. On that discussion about committees, uh, you know, clarifying whether alternates, I, I don't know if I'm reading that correctly, but it really doesn't say, it really just says the chairperson is authorized to appoint committees. Doesn't say who, doesn't say. Authorized to appoint members to committees? I mean, it doesn't, I, I don't know that it says that I, that it even has to be a board member. I mean, and, and once again, that's up for the common council sort of to decide. I don't know that that's the intent of it, but. I mean, special committees may be appointed by the chairperson as he or she deems necessary to carry out the business of the board. Oh. Yeah, I would assume it means that you're appointing board members to the committee. Yeah. I, I see what you're saying. Anything else, guys? We have not had a tough talk meeting. Good. So it's just picked a really fun meeting. So. <laughs> well, at least they were reading on the windows at the same time. Yeah. yeah. They're probably out there cursing oh, us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not a bylaws. Uh, the last, that, are we finished with the bylaws? What was that, Chalice? Are we finished with bylaws? I'll, I'll send this on the team. See if he's available for the next meeting. If not, I'll try to establish a special meeting instead so that we can have him available. And then we'll that sounds good. Yeah. That sounds uh, good. All right. The last thing I have is Violet's home uh, that Rick brought up. Violet's uh, home, like I mentioned earlier, they've had some minor. So, so real quick, Shalise, I. Just I want to point out to the board, yeah. as I discussed earlier, I'm recused from that application. Uh, so before we get into the specifics or you get into specifics of Alice, Rick, was there anything generally like procedure wise you want to discuss while I was still on? Um, not not specific necessarily to that application, but, but all applications moving forward, you know, I, I I think the discussion came into play tonight when we looked at resolutions that had, you know, extensive conditions. Okay. Um, in the whole deal with the Vilas home um, was that the the presentation in as it was finalized wasn't clear in the motion which Dean said, if I were to request, you know, them to come back before the board, it's a suggestion that we're opening up the application again, rather than making it clarification to board members that sat through it and then all of a sudden saw a change to the site plan um, as it was developed. So I think by, you know, making um, making motions that have condition more clear than what we had historically um, really resolves the problem that the Vilas home brought up and my decision to have them come back for clarification and not reopen the application. Does that make sense? So, so Rick, I, you know, to, to add to that, you know, for, for instance, tonight, you know, we, we as a board in an application discussed specific items that potentially might return to us. Um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, like a wrought iron fence out in the front yard or a, or a, uh, you know, a, a structure that's on a, on, uh, that, may have to return for renovations but we discussed it under nor under old applications we would have just left those as oh yeah those were discussed and it sort of left it vague as to whether the board actually considered that as part of their application because they discussed it and they approved things where now uh, i think it's recommended that 
you know, if there's specific conditions or, or things that are discussed that are, that are to be conditioned, uh, are, are less than clear, uh, you know, we need to be very specific on whether an applicant, you know, we're accepting those within our application is unclear or we're requesting that the applicant come back in the future with more detail, that type of thing. Yeah. Rick, by asking them to come back for clarification, on clarification, is it fair to say the board would still have the option of reopening the application? That was, that was the fear that Dean expressed. He expressed it under the condition that, um, you know, once, once you make, uh, once you develop your resolution, if you don't complete it and make it thorough, then you have a very weak argument in a weak position to ask them to come back. If, say there were absolutely no discussion with the bylaws home and, and they're coming back by, uh, voluntarily. So I don't want to completely cite the bylaws home as our reference, but if, if we come up with a resolution and we approve it that, that doesn't identify a specific condition that later on we question if it's not specifically cited uh, to the extent that we want to uh, in, inject our authority to have them come back, it's, it reverts back to the basis of the resolution. Do we have strength in that resolution that gives us the authority that says, you didn't do as we asked, come back because we've reopened it. So it's how, how strong our language is that allows us to extend our authority to after construction has begun. One takeaway is once we approve any omission assignments, it is difficult to change that if it becomes important. That it's the strength of our, it's the strength of our position. The the more um, the more definitive we are in our resolution, the stronger our position is. That if someone's not compliant with our intent, that we can require them to come back, or we lose our strength by having a weak resolution, and. They just not be required. And and it, yeah, and if I were to have said, you know, the bylaws home had to come back or reopen it, Dean says our argument would have been weak. The intent was everybody had involvement in conversation regarding that courtyard that I didn't want anybody to feel disillusioned that, you know, we weren't given the full. Um, full scope of the project, whereas they did what we asked them to do and they put it in writing. Um, so it, it's just clarification, that's it. Do, does, I, I, I don't know that I want details of what's happening in files because that sounds like a long conversation, but it seems like when we approve something, we're approving, I mean, there's a site plan that's yeah. highly detailed. Not in this case, as you, that was a, a footnote that showed clarification in the future. It just showed the, what specifically was it called, Chalice? Memory care garden. Memory care garden. So yeah, the note on the plan was, it was an empty space in the courtyard area uh, that said proposed <clears throat> memory care garden. I think it might have said C note. And then down at the bottom of the plan, there was a note there, um, that said proposed memory care garden to include pavers, uh, pergola, seating, something else. And then it, there was some language about, you know, quiet plans to make theory or something mm -hmm. along those lines. Dean's position was that the language was the, the detail, the final details that were provided in construction 
um, were consistent with what was approved. They provided a courtyard with a stone patio path, and seating, with pergola. There is a log house which is not included in the bill, but he felt that the way there was a place. Yeah, we talked about that too. It was pretty yeah. broad strokes, as I recall. Yeah, the the water fountain happened to be our segue to to get them back because it, you know it's my position. Whenever you add a water element, you add the potential of people drowning. Okay, you know, coming from code enforcement, if you have six inches of water, you have the potential of somebody drowning. So, in a memory garden with Alzheimer's patients, if they were to sit on the ledge of the fountain. You know, their balance is off. They could fall in. I mean, anybody could trip. And the scenarios are endless. But it, it, when, when it was brought up, this is where it gets kind of toasty. <laughs> um, had they ignored our concern about a water fountain, they at that point, they've been apprised that the water fountain could be an issue. So <laughs> they either come in and say, yeah, let's have a discussion, or they say, no, we'll take our chances. Nobody will drown in the water fountain. So it's, the, the point being, we have to have resolutions that are complete, thorough, and detailed. Right, Jim? <laughs> I think that's the, that's that's a good summary. I mean, it, once again, I think the board just needs to be careful on on what generalities and detail uh, that they they may accept, whether it's in, you know presented in written form or presented in plan form. Uh, you know, and and ultimately, uh, we've discussed this before as well. This this plan is something that gets referred to someone else who never sits in our board meetings and never. Uh, per se is taken part in these application process and they're handed a plan to enforce. So if we hand them a, a plan of generalities, it's awfully tough to maybe tough to enforce. And I'm referring specifically to the building department and quite frankly, the building department in, in, uh, in, in most cases is, is the, uh, is the group that's going to refer anything back to us anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, I just want to make sure that we don't turn into the, you know, the police. <laughs> We're not out there. Well, wait a minute. I mean, you know, things that we've approved, I've seen all kinds of variations on the theme, you know, after the fact. And but it's not my job to go up and say, hey, that's not what you said you were going to do. So, you know, so I'm, but the, the building inspector has to sign off on stuff. So, you know. There's a process for doing this. I, I don't know that we need to, you know, overstep our bounds here and be responsible for what actually happens because if we have a comprehensive resolution that the building inspector or whoever, whoever the inspectors are that have to sign off before the place can open up, if they've got a detailed resolution, then that's all they need. And if there are serious um discrepancies there then that's for them to take action and i would imagine it's up to them to say you have to go back to the planning board because you've got to make some changes here you did not comply with the resolution that was passed but i don't see that as being our responsibility if there's any you know suggestion that we somehow be following up on these things yeah and uh, loretta this wasn't um fortunately it's it's a case of it's still in the planning stage for the, the Vilas home specifically. Um, so we, we, have an, we have an opportunity to, I think, provide that extra level of uh, safety in our discussion um, because it was quite an extensive conversation. And I felt it necessary that everybody be given the uh, the courtesy of being updated as to the application because it it really filled a small courtyard into a pretty pretty extensive uh, 
area. It, it's beautiful. It's going to be nice. But I, I felt that it was more than what we saw and more than what we thought we were approving. So anyway. So Rick, if I could add two things that, that Dean did kind of recommend after the piece of the guidance he provided. Um, one was if there's an area, you know, where there's unknown details at the time of approval of the plan. So like the Beverly Fair Garden, they did not have a finalized uh, detail for how that architecture here at the time. In that that case, you guys would want to place a condition on the approval that when the detail is finalized for the specific area of the site, yeah. they must return for approval of it. Um, that's option number one. And then option or not, not necessarily option number two, but the other consideration is does it constitute a material change from what was approved? In this case, we need to feel that it was a material change because it was fairly consistent with the notes on the plan that was going to be proposed in Richard Garden, which referred to which called out a specific note that described most of what they have included in this quarter yeah. plan. So in this case, it doesn't constitute a material plan, uh, material change, and there is no condition compelling it to come back. To come back. Right. So just kind of a takeaway here is, and I think that's what you're getting at, Rick, correct me if I'm wrong, is when there's something unclear, when there's something you guys want to know for sure that you guys have the final review of, and maybe it's not identified at the time of approval, make sure you put in a condition but it needs to come back with that, that detail has been finalized. Yeah. And I, I think the historic site on the Court Street was really a good example of exercising that, that discussion and Dean's recommendation. Yeah. Because we were quite thorough with that. I think it included everything that we needed it to include. Is that it? That's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All motion. I make a motion to adjourn. One second. <laughs> All third. I guess we'll keep Eric. Just call him over. Hi. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.